For all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. Okay, looks like we are live tonight on Standing for Truth, late night on SFT. So it looks like we've got a good audience already. This is going to be a lot of fun. First episode of our series, Another Evolutionist Bites the Dust. Unfortunately for Vice Rhino, his, uh, he is going to be the first, the first of many to get demolished. And uh, the videos we have prepared for this series, you guys are going to have a lot of fun with. We're really looking forward to it. Um, and of course, uh, what I should say actually is the fact that all of these Big Shot YouTube, Evolutionist, for example, Vice Rhino, Pelogia, um, Aaron Ra, Professor Stick, you know, we're going to be taking them all on. And that is to say, we are also um, issuing a challenge. Any of these guys that we are going to demolish in this series, we are also willing to debate. I'll debate any of them. All you got to do is email me. We can set it up on Modern Day Debate. I'd love to get into the ring with, uh, you know, these pseudo science pushers like Vice Rhino, Pelogia, of course. So we'll see. We'll see. And no excuses. I mean, one of the uh, more popular YouTube evolutionists is Conspiracy Cats. Um, to be honest with you, who seems to be a lot more um, knowledgeable on the areas uh, and topics of, of science that deal with creation evolution. I've debated him twice, one here, one here. So if, if conspiracy cats, um, great guy, fun debates. If he's got the guts to, um, take on members of team SFT, then hopefully these guys do as well. So quick announcement, uh, Thursday, get yourselves ready. We're going to be having Ken Hoven back on here to debate Derek Barnes. This is Derek here. You might remember him from his debate with myself on Modern Day Debate. There's me and Derek there. Human Origins, Best Explained by Creation or Evolution. That, so that was a really good debate. This one's going to be awesome. Title is, uh, is Evolution Science. Also glad to hear that we're getting some good feedback. A lot of people are enjoying the new Refuting the Critics book. The critics are failing miserably. So uh, we're going to have a lot of fun with that. And... Ponds come to people evolution. So uh, there we go. We got our boy there. <laughs> so yeah, this is going to be a lot of fun. Um, last announcement I just got a couple days ago, Dr. Rob Stadler's new books, The Scientific Approach to Evolution and The Stairway to Life. Um, I've been reading them. Awesome books, really up to date. And uh, then he's going to be joining us for a, an interview, a must watch interview. This guy is is great. Uh, he's been interviewed by John Maddox. Really good interview. Check that out. So we're looking forward to that. We're going to be having him on as well. So enough with announcements. We want to get right to it. I've got Brother Ra, Matt, Brother Praise here. Um, guys, thanks for being here. We're going to have some fun. How are you guys doing tonight? Doing good, man. Ready to rock. This will be fun. We, uh, we went to Vice Rhino's channel and he had just made a video. Um, uh, again on creationism which is funny because that's pretty much what his whole channel is dedicated to so it's not like we're picking on somebody that doesn't know the subject here this is one of the higher and more popular um atheist gurus right here so we're coming after him now and uh we'll see if he's a as knowledgeable as he says he is all of his all of his forty thousand people that watch these videos are going to quickly see who he is real quick 
they're gonna yes they're really gonna see uh how little vice rhino understands on these topics he definitely chose the wrong video to review <laughs> recently with dr jensen so we're going to be having a lot of fun judging by his video and, and everybody in the audience is going to be able to tell this for themselves um he clearly has not read replacing darwin he's clearly not looked into our arguments so this is going to be a lot of fun we'll have a lot of tough questions for him i doubt we will get any answers but what's funny is these popular guys okay who we've recently done um a series on taking on a, a couple of our favorite critics um they in a way have, have better arguments and understanding than these big guys so this is going to be a lot of fun um, when already your your best critics, I would say, are kind of uh, cornered. They haven't uh, given any sufficient rebuttal. They're dodging, right? Five Ds of dodge. <laughs> dodge, duck, dip, dive, and dodge. They're masters at it. So, yeah, we're going to have a lot of fun. We've already got a lot of super stickers, super chats coming in. Redefine Living. Good to see you, brother. Thanks so much. Doki Doki. Thank you. Shadow Dancer. Doki Doki again. You guys are awesome. Redefine living. It's a super sticker war tonight. So this is gonna be this is gonna be a lot of fun. Who's gonna take it home? Doki Doki's the reigning champion at this point. So <laughs> and if you guys haven't noticed from last night, we got the new logo, SFT, uh, courtesy of Matt. We got a custom made. I love it. Uh, we're gonna be having a shirt out soon on that one too. So definitely a lot to look forward to. Praise, what's going on, man? Good to be good to have you here. Yeah, good to be here, but it's going to be exciting. It'll be fun tonight to uh, join with you guys. All right. Thanks. Thanks, brother. Why don't we, uh, Matt, I'll let you take it away from here if you want to get the video started or ho however you want to proceed. All right. I'm going to screen share. Let me know if you can see. Um, it didn't ask me anything about sound, so let me know if uh, that doesn't work. Oh, you have to screen share for me. I'm not. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. I'll get you the new the new information for this one. Okay. No big deal. <laughs> uh, all right. Here we go. Let me know if you guys can hear it good. That's Vice Rhino, by the way. <laughs> team standing for truth. Team standing for truth over him. <laughs> Darwin disproved the old creation. Yep, we got it. Awesome. All right, here we go. He did not disprove the modern idea, which means we're on a level playing field again. Not having been disproved 160 years ago does not automatically place you on a level playing field. Evolution still flies in the face of creationism, and we know that evolution happens. Opinion. <laughs> That's an opinion. Well, the problem is, is he didn't actually read Jensen's book because he's not saying that his definition of evolution is entirely different, right? Their model is directly based on beneficial mutations, taking something, for example, like a land mammal, dog, rat type thing to a whale. That is untrue. So when he's made, he's making an equivocation is what he's doing. And uh, people don't understand that because they don't actually know the model. He's one of them. So I just thought I'd throw that out there. If you want well, to. in the same time, they love to just throw that out there, right? The false equivalency. So he's saying, you know, evolution's ha it happens. Evolution has been proven. But typically, you want to ask them, you know, what is your definition of evolution? Because we're all going to agree that if by biological evolution – you mean a change in allele frequencies in populations over generations, then nobody's going to disagree with that. But the question is, and the question I would ask Vice Rhino, is what are the types of genetic requirements that would be required to take a single-celled like ancestor billions of years ago into all the life forms we see today? Because I would assume Vice Rhino believes that whales, pine trees, banana plants, and humans are all related through common ancestry. So the types of changes and requirements necessary for that type of fish to fisherman, large scale evolution, um, the types of changes we see, right? Changes in allele frequencies and populations over time, for example, are actually opposite of the types of changes that are necessary for that type of pond scum to people 
evolution. So that's why you're going to see Dr. Jensen here talks about how ancestry is fundamentally a genetics question, as well as if evolution, that type of large scale evolution is even possible because you, you'll notice, and we'll get into this a little bit more later, but they'll want to look to the phenotype when we should be looking at the genotype and not to, you know, go on too long about this, but even your best beneficial mutations we know, Matt, are reductive. They're not taking things forward um you know but we'll, we'll we'll get into that a little bit more later if you want to keep going yeah it's a baseless claim though and uh he didn't specify is, yeah. what scale he needs to specify what scale of evolution we see right i noticed that a lot of them just say well we see speciation occurring therefore evolution is true just a perfect example of them not knowing what what they're talking about right well, and we're gonna see that when he talks about speciation but he won't tell us you know what is what is happening on a on a genotypic level when it comes to speciation because we know and we're going to be showing a lot of this tonight we know that speciation events oftentimes occur from shifts in heterozygosity to homozygosity which simply means uh, a decrease in the genetic potential or allelic variability so that once again comes down to the fact that people like vice rhino they want to look to the phenotype and then proclaim that what is occurring, what is being observed at the phenotypic level, right, the physical features, is evidence for his pseudoscientific belief in fish to fisherman evolution. When in fact, we look to the genotypic level, and what we see is the degradation of pre existing functional systems, the breaking down of pre existing functional systems. And we could go on all day, and we'll probably talk about it later. All their best examples for. Um, so-called novel changes when it comes to information adding <laughs> mutations because their best beneficial mutations are oftentimes uh, at the expense of uh, pre-existing information protein systems that are being broken down. So that's not going to take a single celled like ancestor billions of years ago into a whale over time. So yeah, I, I, praise, you're right. It's, it's opinions. They just make the statement Right, as if anybody disagrees with evolution, we all dis we all agree with change. Biblical creationists, we don't believe in what's called species fixity. We believe in adaptation. We believe in pre-programmed change. We believe in speciation. Um, yeah, go ahead, guys. All right, here we go. So creationism has extra burden on its burden of proof. Not only do you have to falsify one of the most scientifically robust theories that we have, you then have to provide positive evidence in favor of creation. Because proving evolution wrong would not automatically mean that creation is right. <laughs> you notice they always say that, but they never <laughs> give you an alternative. They never say, well, there's this as an alternative instead. They know that if evolution is wrong, creation has to be true. They just always, ad they, they proclaim their, their little argument there, but they never back it up with an alternative. Right. And I think he's shifting the goalposts there, well, too. Like, who made him arbiter of what, of, just because of, okay, so evolution is falsified. What makes him, what gives him the, the credence to say, well, therefore not creationism? He needs to demonstrate that. If, if the biological diversity that we see today and all of the life we see, obviously, even in the fossil record that's extinct, everything living today, if it did not evolve over time through universal common descent, if those nested hierarchical patterns are not explained through descent with modification, there's only one other alternative, and I love how they just throw that out, like disproving evolution is not going to prove creation. There's no other alternatives, unless Bryce Rhino wants to be the one who believes in the Matrix, or we're not all really <laughs> here. <laughs> you know, the so in the middle, even logic backs it up. There, there has to be the only alternative we have through uh, through deductive processes would be, you know, intelligent design or creationism. You know, I'm just going to give them the tough questions. I want to say we had an interview the other day. Um, Anthony, myself, praise you were there, and Dr. Ryan Hayes. We demolished abiogenesis, and I've put the challenge out there for any ev evolutionist, atheist, naturalist, materialist, whatever. Debunk the video. They're not going to be able to. And Vice Rhino, guess what? He's also going to scoff later on at the fact that we propose God would have created Adam and Eve with pre-existing functional DNA differences, which makes sense both theologically and scientifically, 
which would also apply to the biblical kinds. He'll scoff at that. He will also say there's no other, you know, disproving evolution doesn't mean creation. Well, when it comes to the origin of life, okay, every single one of their scenarios, metabolism first, RNA world, for example, these have all been demolished. There's no evidence for origin of life research and, and um, that actually occurring, non-living chemicals to a living you know, single cell, for example, and there's chicken and egg problems that abound. So for example, he probably holds to the RNA world. And what's funny is they've had to do this because DNA could not have come first, but it just turns out, and I'm asking Vice Rhino to present evidence for abiogenesis. He won't be able to, just like all the other atheists. RNA is more unstable than DNA. I asked this question to Erica recently. I'll try and word it this, uh, roughly the same way, just to be fair. I was talking about how in our cells, one single cell is more complicated than the most advanced automobile on this planet anyways, to start with. But in our cells, we have about a million DNA breaks every single day, okay? And yet most of these are fixed by the amazing, amazingly complex repair systems that are actually found in the cell itself. My question to Vice Rhino, RNA is less stable than DNA. And DNA requires many amazing DNA repair systems in order to what? Survive over time. So how in the world can these naturalists actually propose that this RNA world is plausible? The building blocks of RNA are threefold. Okay, we're looking at a sugar, a base, and a phosphate. Naturally, these things do not bind to form nucleotide bases needed for RNA. Right from the start, you're going to have a major issue even trying to get these building blocks for RNA, the building blocks are incredibly stable, but here's the chicken and egg problem and then we'll move on. I want him to answer this question, he won't though. Enzymes are needed as a catalyst in the cell, okay? Now, in reality, what we know about genomics is that in living cells, protein-based enzymes do most of the work. So, Vice Rhino, how did life change from RNA enzymes, okay, to protein enzymes? When did this occur? chicken and egg problems, okay? Because the information in the DNA requires enzymes to read it, but those instructions to build the enzymes are on the DNA, which cannot be read without the enzymes. What came first, enzymes or the DNA? If he wants to look to the metabolism first, hypothesis has been destroyed. It's been demolished, it's been debunked years ago. We could go on and on about abiogenesis, but I would just say and challenge any atheist to go look at that interview with Dr. Ryan Hayes, where we, uh, this is just one, one example of the many problems for abiogenesis. Go through that video. We dare you to address the problems associated with origin of life, answer our questions, and it's just not possible. It's not gonna happen, so. Yeah, but ahead, also, yeah, I was about to say, um, well, scientists do science. Well, who interprets the science? So I think that's another issue I'd like to ask him. Who is he appealing to to say that evolution is the most robust theory? Uh, it can't be scientists because they only merely do experimentation. They only do what's probable or, you know, what's approximations and things like that. So uh, I would even say intelligent design is the most parsimonious because we see right. even... Richard Dawkins says we see design in nature. Um, so you have to go even against your the paradigm there to go against that. Well, it's like what I was talking about earlier. Great point, Praise. Even the DNA repair enzymes or epigenetics, which we will get into later because he talks about that. This is all evidence for forethought. Okay, forward thinking. Is Vice Rhino going to claim that evolution, natural selection, other processes, mutations have a mind to evolve something like a spare tire, redundant mechanisms, epigenetic modifications, these switches. We have millions of switches in our DNA just waiting to be turned on and off, oftentimes via environmental factors. So is Vice Rhino going to, how do, what type of evolutionary process? We know natural selection can't do it, mutations can't do it, can build that which requires forethought, foreknowledge. And what you said, praise, great point. Empirical science is that which is testable, repeatable, okay, requires observations, retesting, experimentation, origin of life, universal common descent, not just a change in allele frequencies and populations over time. These things are not repeatable, okay, and they're constantly <laughs> getting their predictions wrong, which we're going to talk about later. They're constantly having to force fit the data. Um, yeah, but we're going to talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, message uh, George, by the way, he couldn't get in. He didn't get an email. 
so well. Great memes, by the way, Matt. He, he put yeah. it up there. Read I think this, this is pretty good. Animals give the appearance of having been designed by a theoretically sophisticated and practically ingenious physicist or engineer. Like, what else? <laughs> That's an inference to the best explanation. That's the most parsimonious position. Parsimonious, yeah. Creation. Yeah, I like those quotes because there you couldn't find a bigger critic against creation than this guy. And look, they admit it. They admit that they have to keep reminding themselves that this isn't designed. It looks like it, but it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> and they convince themselves it's not true. That's what evolution is. It's trying to convince yourself God doesn't exist or everything's not created or intelligent de designed. That's why they're not it looks convinced. like a car. It drives like a car. It sounds like a car, but it's not a car. <laughs> That's literally... <laughs> Exactly. That's literally their argument. And they all suffer from confirmation bias. It's so funny because we've spent the last couple of weeks demolishing Dr. Dan and, and Erica, and we're done with them for a long time. Um, and what's funny is the fact that when we put out those videos, I found evolutionists in the comment sections, one in particular on Dr. Dan's video that said, you know, Standing for Truth recently put out some videos on Erica. Can you let her know so she can respond to it? Let me translate that. These brain dead, brainwashed evolutionists, okay, not all of them, but most of them uh, that look to their prophets, their apostles of this science fiction based religion known as pawn scum to people evolution. They see the videos we're putting out and they see that we're demolishing their prophets, their apostles of evolutionism. And they get worried they're sweating they're like oh no you know uh, what am i going to do if pawns come to people evolution is not true so they need they need the confirmation bias they need their leaders to make a response so they can wipe off the sweat and say whew that was close you know i almost had to believe in a creator or god and here's the funny part regardless of how bad the response video is as long as they see there was some type of response they're not going to look at it objectively that's good enough for them because they just want the, the confirmation. It's confirmation bias. Exactly. Exactly. That's why I'm, most of the time they don't even understand what they're hearing in the first place. You can really get a good observation from this by just going to R and Raw's um, uh, flood series where he goes and he debunks the flood model and he has a seven part series or eight part. They're so bad that you're going through the comment section and, um, Everyone is agreeing with what everything that he's saying. Like, oh, this is the best video that there is. How could anybody ever believe that stupidity? And then when you go, hey, talk to me about dendrochronology. He goes, that's not my field of study. Oh, it's not your field, really. So you're going to make a two-hour video on it regardless. But yet you're not confident enough to talk about it live. I get it. So see the problem? Without their script, without them just Googling the answer and making it sound appealing to the audience, they have nothing. Well, here's the thing. Um... Erica, I caught her, and we don't want to talk too much about her. We put on so much material, but here's the point. I caught her going to other people that we've debunked, Evo Grad, Joshua Swamidas, Dr. Dan, Herman Mays, for example, came back with almost a word-for-word -word response. We addressed it. We demolished it. She couldn't answer the question. Um, so she said, well, don't you worry. I'm going to make a video response in the next couple of weeks. I said, why don't you just join me in a hangout tonight? The last three nights I asked her to. Um, I even screenshotted where she said she doesn't want to do it because that's the thing in a live discussion. She won't be able to answer it. She won't be able to address the problems and these evolutionists, instead of tapping out, they oftentimes uh, have to go to other deceivers, other prophets of the science fiction religion and look for an answer, regardless of how weak that answer may be. You know, as long as they provide an answer, they're going to feel deep down inside that uh, they can still hold to their naturalistic worldview and their belief that banana plants and whales are related so um we've got oh, yeah. some super sticker shadow dancer brother nicholas good to see us as sft is on point here spongebob imagination good to see you lots of people in the chat so lots of super stickers thank you guys for the support uh good sorry go ahead matt I was just going to say, think about uh, poor Vice Rhino himself, right? Um, this is what he's been doing. This is what he's been fighting against for a really long time. I'm, imagine if he admitted, oh, I was, I actually, the, the evidence is good. It's clear. I, I admit I was wrong. <laughs> yeah, all of his followers. <laughs> yeah, <it's> <laughs> right. He would admit everything he said was just like, oh, I just Googled it anyway. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I was wrong. I was misled. They'll never admit to that. They, their, their future depends on their, them continually staying stable into that. Very few people can leave their indoctrination. Very few. 
Well, it's funny you say that, and which you which you touched on earlier is the fact that people like Vice Rhino, Pelogia, Professor Stick. Just go look at your popular YouTubers that got like fifty thousand subs, hundred thousand subs. I would even put R and Ron this camp for ex for example. They'll write their script for their video, right? Someone like Pelogia, good at editing, for example. They read their script, put their video out, make it look like they're experts in the topics and controversy of creation versus evolution, but then they won't do a live discussion or live debate because that's where they get exposed because now they're off script. They can't just read for their, you know, 15, 20 minute video. That's where they get exposed, but they have such big channels and they have a lot on the line, for example, so they can't risk getting exposed. And that's why I, I always point out the fact and give credit to conspiracy cats because he's one of the most popular as well. And he's been willing, I believe he's a science teacher, um, and also he knows genetics quite well. So maybe he's one of the few that does know the, the science and willing to debate. But 99.9% .9 of the other ones, you know, they ain't going to do it. And if oh. they respond to this video, well, you know that they're, uh, they're going to be getting a heck of a response from us. Uh, go ahead, Matt. Oh, absolutely. That's why he's going to see this. And he's going to hear you challenging him to a debate. And he's going to think to himself, oh, no, I, I ha I, I'm, I'm called out. So I either look bad by not debating or I debate and get demolished and I look bad. So he's at a lows lose situation here and he knows, right. oh, that's, this is what's, that's, what's really bad for him. And they all, all these big guys know it. Like that's why, what, just recently, uh, Aaron Raw turned you down and who was the other big one? Professor Dave. Yeah. Professor Dave, he's turned me down a couple of times. So we, yeah. <laughs> we're going to have a good time <laughs> debunking <laughs> some of his videos too. Praise your best yeah, bud, right. Dave. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, here, let's go. Uh, did you join us? Did you yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Did you want anything to say before we go on? <laughs> uh, well, uh, I just want to apologize for being a little late. Uh, I had to run back actually uh, to, to come in, but um did you guys dis discuss molecular clock? No, not yet. Oh, uh, okay. That's we will soon, though. That's up? coming up, so. Oh, okay. Now I'll wait. Okay. Yeah, the uh, yeah the fun's just starting, George, and we're glad you're here, okay. man. You're a beast. You're a beast on these topics, so we've got – this is going to be fun. we got an army tonight. Yeah, here we go. Let's go. Oops. The neutral mutation rate. Oh, I'm fairly I skipped ahead. <laughs> it's because George mentioned molecular clocks. We wanted to get right to it. <laughs> books you find in popular books, those do not disprove creation, which means you can't use it in support of evolution. If you want to claim that all of the evidence in favor of evolution does not disprove creation, that doesn't mean that it no longer supports evolution. That just means that you have adjusted the creation model to include evolution, which I don't think you have. So he doesn't know. So he's misrepresenting. Oh, go ahead, Matt. Go ahead. I, well, I'm just saying he, he obviously doesn't know anything that Jensen's ever written because he just says, I don't think you even have that. So he's literally made a video against this guy, which he's clearly never read his book. He doesn't know anything about his model, doesn't know anything about him. And he just assumes, kind of like his religious belief of evolutionism, that he doesn't have the information. <laughs> Isn't that nice? Which is why he's about to get demolished here. So he actually misrepresented what Jensen said. And I think I actually have a couple slides on this here. Let me see. I'm going to share it real quick just to make it uh, make sense for the audience. I'm not sure. Oh, I might have to. I, I close Let me you. see. Okay. Perfect. Let me see. It's just loading. So as it's loading, it's um, to avoid dead air. So what Dr. Jensen is actually saying here, and boom. There's a lot of lines of evidence, okay, that are what's called agnostic to the debate of creation versus evolution. It's like saying, why is the sky blue? You know, and then you give a reason. The sky is blue because of creation. No, that doesn't make any sense because evolution can also explain why the sky is blue. You know, why is the earth a sphere and not flat? You know, well, because of creation. No, evolution can explain that too. So there's a lot of lines of evidence that are um, agnostic to the debate. And Vice Rhino obviously missed this point as he's going to miss all the other points. So the point is, as you can see here on the screen, homology, for example. Well, homology is expected on both sides. Humans build in homologous patterns, of course, shared designs for shared functions. 
Uh, over here as well, we've got nested hierarchies. Those are products of design, as you can as you can see here. When it comes to nested hierarchical patterns, it's just common sense that humans are going to share more in terms of morphology, anatomy, genetics, and physiology with a chimp or with an old world monkey, new world monkey, than it would with a fish or a bacteria. It's just common sense. You know, this is expected based on the similarities in a variety of um of ways, of course. Now, according to the evolution, they'll just say, well, humans share more with a chimp than they do with a fish because we have a more recent common ancestor with, um, with, with a chimp, of course. So both models can explain it. it's agnostic. You know, it's not going to disprove creation. It's not going to disprove evolution. Even mosaics, for example, they can point to a couple fancy mosaics in the fossil record, but we know as human engineers, we also build what appears to be transitional like vehicles. Like in the military, they build, as you can see here, uh, these are called military uh, assault vehicles, a amphibious assault vehicles. They're literally designed for the transition between land and the sea. So we start from the Genesis account that the, the Bible tells us that we are created in man's image. Okay, therefore we should get a sense for how the way God might have designed the biological world based on how we have designed things as humans, as, as engineers. And we've built in hierarchical patterns. We build in homologous patterns. We build uh, vehicles, especially in the military, that uh, blend the features of land and uh, an ocean, for example. So the point is that Jensen's trying to make that he totally missed. We need to then focus on that, which can differentiate between the models. And then that's where we point to things that Vice Rhino will not be able to explain, like orphan genes, functional orphan genes, for example, that are taxonomically restricted. Y chromosome, molecular clocks, mitochondrial DNA, molecular clocks, DNA function. They expect most of the genome to be non-functional evolutionary leftovers. They expect in endogenous retroviruses and retrotransposons to be nothing more than junk, but we now know that they are functional. For example, even the homologous patterns, even that which is shared in humans and chimps, for example, many similar genes between humans and chimps, guess what? They're expressed extremely different extremely differently, and the expression profiles bear no signs of selection or having uh, been evolved. The fact is genes associated with the brain, uh, the testes, metabolic functions, cell transport show distinctly different expression levels. Guess what? Between humans and chimps. So we're, I'm just given a, a, a number of lines of evidence that can differentiate between the two that vice rhino will not be able to explain. So that's the entire point. Go ahead, guys. Right. It seems to me there's a little bit of cognitive dissonance there, too. Like, ooh, creation, therefore <laughs> evolution. That's what I get out of it. Well, there is, yeah, there is, there is, and, and just a lot of misunderstanding because they're oftentimes pointing to lines of evidence that it just really aren't helping to further or advance the creation versus evolution debate since both models can explain the data. That's why we need to look to the differentiating evidence, which one of those molecular clocks and he's going to talk about later. So we're going to destroy that. Um, Brother George, did you have any, any points, I guess, before we moved on? Yeah, yeah. I was just going to add to your amphibian vehicles. I imagine if the only evidence for a platypus was a fossil. I can bet you 100% that they would be using that as, a, as an intermediate um, creature between two other creatures. You know, the duckbill uh, lays eggs, <laughs> sw swims in the water. So I've used that evidence before. Uh, the, you were talking about mosaics. That's a, a that's a classic example of a mosaic. Exactly right. Exactly right. Platypus. If it was found in the fossil record, it would be used as the perfect, um, the perfect so-called transitional form. Like you said, the creature that the platypus is. It's a mammal. OK, but yet it has it has a duck bill, webbed feet, it lays eggs. And in addition to possessing other characteristics that might be called reptilian. So you're looking just in the platypus, you've got characteristics of reptiles, birds and mammals. And if found in the fossil record, it would probably be considered a primitive mammal mammal. Um, so you're right. Yeah, and, and that's what we find a select few of these mosaics in the fossil record that they interpret 
as transitional. Yeah, well, when in fact, if evolution was true, the transitional mosaic should be the rule and not the exception. The exception proves the rule. We find very few. Well, th th those of us that have that have actually done programming, and I'm not a full-blown programmer, but I have uh, written programs in uh, the SQL language. Uh, look, you you reuse routines or subroutines from one program to the other. It goes back like, uh, I think Dr. Hoven uh, uses the example of Microsoft, you know, PowerPoint versus Word uh, versus Excel. I'm sure you'll find a lot of similarity in in a lot of the code that they use there. But one of the other things I wanted to mention, every programmer that I know of always uh, at the very start of the program writes down author, date, and version, right? Ima imagine when we crack the DNA code, if somewhere in that, in that <laughs> strand we find out author, Jesus, date, 6,000 years ago, <laughs> version, <laughs> You know, 1.00.001. Imagine that. Right. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure how many programmers are, are, are actually in the chat at the moment, but uh, uh, I think I think most of them will agree with me that uh, we use subroutines amongst a lot of our programs that, so that we don't have to literally rewrite uh, thousands, thousands of lines of code it, it wouldn't make it. It wouldn't make any sense. But they no, look to that. Right. It, it's it's good engineering. It's good design. That's that's correct. That's why you find a lot of a lot of genes are uh, similar in in a number of the creatures, uh, and it's the way they're expressed. Um, I wish I knew how to write code like that. But anyway, I'm 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 not going to compare myself with uh, Jesus. So George, would you say that uh, co or Code is a language. Would you say that? Oh, definitely, definitely, it is a language. Just like the alphabet is uh, a code that describes a yeah. uh, language. Uh, you know, there's there's different la language codes. There's Greek language. There's English, um, Japanese, Chinese. So e every ethnicity pretty much has their own uh, code for their own language. So yeah, yeah. Well, and, and here's here's the thing, right? We didn't even touch on this earlier. That's a great point you brought up, George, and and praise. When when it comes to life, okay, life isn't just based on biochemicals. We can literally have all the biochemicals. Chemicals, and I often say, and I'll say it to Vice Rhino then, I can say, you know what? Because he's going to have all the excuses, right, on how he can get these biochemicals in a an, an origin of life situation. Well, you know what, Vice Rhino? Have all the amino acids, have all the proteins. I'll give you RNA. I'll give you some DNA. You know, the perfect recipe for life. Number one, as we talked about earlier, they're never going to them, assemble themselves. And let's say they did. Information has still not been introduced into those molecules. And I like to look at it like a book. You've got information in a book, but the ink molecules themselves are not the information. It is ink molecules written on paper. That's it. I could, I could pour some ink on a page and I'm not going to get information out of it. The information comes from what? A mind that then organizes those molecules into words, sentences, paragraphs, chapters, books, the book of life, the DNA code. So he can have all those bio, uh, bio molecules, but Vice Rhino, you have an information problem. Explain how the information comes about to actually make life life. Exactly. Imagine you you uh, had uh, your dog give birth to a puppy and one of those puppies, say, a day later dies. Now, th there you go. You've got a, a perfect example of a, of a creature that's got every living cell that you could possibly want. Ask them to bring it to life. Right. They don't have yep. to, you, they, they don't have to worry about creating DNA and RNA and, and all that stuff. All of it's there. <laughs> it's all there. Bring it to life yeah. and they can't. Yeah. I just, you know, one last thing, I guess, before we move on, because we got some, some good stuff. I just find it so funny that they want to ignore the differences, okay? They want to ignore the differences that exist between 
you know, they say humans and chimps are our closest common ancestor. We descended from a common ancestor with the chimps and humans. Okay. And they want to just point out the similarities all day. They want to point out the similarities in the entirety of the biological world, but they, they want to ignore the major differences like the orphan genes, incomplete lineage sorting is a problem for them. Overall genome similarity is actually lower than, they, than they've said. We can touch on that earlier. The Y chromosome DNA, the fact, as I talked about earlier, major differences in the human and chimp genomes in terms of how these genes are utilized or expressed. But when it comes to the similarities, the, homo the homology, the fact that they're still using this as evidence really is a sad state of affairs because if you want to look at humans and chimps and other, you know, apes and the ape family or monkeys, well, like other mammals, we're all mammals. We have similar cell physiologies, similar morphological similarities as well. So therefore, should we be surprised that we have a large number of genes that share high levels of similarity in their, in their genetic sequence, similarities in morphology, for example, like this is just expected based on a design hypothesis so yeah simple logical mm. oh, i'm gonna screen share again my bad oh okay. let me get you matt i'm so used to you just having controls boom good to go <laughs> all right here we go Creationists claim the idea that there is some predetermined amount of potential diversity contained within the genome, and evolution is just the expression of these different potential combinations. But genetic analysis shows that it's not simply a reshuffling of already existing genes. There are actual mutations involved. In dog genomes, for instance, there have been millions of single nucleotide polymorphisms involved in creating the different breeds single nucleotide polymorphism being geneticist talk for a point mutation, one single base pair in the DNA sequence getting swapped out for a different base pair. If all the variation was already contained within the original genome, there wouldn't be need for the SNP mutations to create different dog breeds. It would all have been there in the original genome. And that's just one type of mutation. There are insertions, duplications, and deletions as well. So we know that mutations in the genome increase the diversity of the group, but you claim that it was all just in the original genome. Do you have any data to back this up? Well, Yeah, yeah. Matt does. <laughs> Who wants to go first? <laughs> you, you go ahead, brother Matt. I was talking a lot there. The floor is yours, man. Destroy that. All right. Um, well, first of all, point mutations, very simple things. They occur quite often. Matter of fact, one of the largest eukaryotic organism uh, studies ever done on uh, evolution went to the uh, primordial waters, that's what they call them anyway, of Yosemite's National Park. And what they did is they scooped down and they found that there were three different varieties of bacteria that lived there. And then they um, brought them back and they... They cloned them, basically, and they, they made a fourth variety. So they had another test. And this experiment went on for thousands of generations. And uh, I can link the study later. And what they found is that the only mutations that were occur occurring during the study were point mutations. And very little happened except for some of the diversity that, that happened. They remained bacteria. The adaptations were uh, negligible. The only adaptation that occurred was that of the pH of the water adjustment for the new area, because of course they wanted them to evolve. So they put them in a more of an acidic environment. And the only thing that actually happened was that epigenetically, they adapted to that more acidic environment. The point mutations did nothing for them. And those were the only types of mutations that did occur. So yes, point mutations can definitely occur in dogs and wolves and these different uh, things. But the speciation, what's causing it to go quickly is the genetic drift, the recombination, the gene conversion, the gene flow, and the epigenetic Genetics. That's what's occurring that's rapid. That's why evolutionists predicted speciation would be a very, very, very slow event. That's why Darwin said we're only going to find a new finch on the island every 3,000 years. What did they find? It's every 3.3 years, completely contradictory to what he actually said. Why? Because he goes by the mechanism of evolution, which is a slow gradualism process brought on by mutation. But our model is very different. That's why we see speciation rates and numbers what we do today. So 
Another one, a good example is when they took eukaryotes because everybody's like, oh, they always experimenting on bacteria. They never study eukaryotes. Well, they actually have. They took, um, again, a eukaryotic yeast called Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and they put them in five different environments. Uh, I think the first one was Congo red, which is a carcinogenic dye. Then they put it in um, – uh, a highly alkaline environment, I think over eight pH, uh, not too alkaline, I guess. Um, and they went, went down the line. They keep changing its environment and they never allowed fixation to occur. So they constantly were in environments that was forcing them to evolve. And again, zero evolution was occurring, only epigenetic adaptations to their environment that was happening. The exact opposite of what they needed to occur for their, you know, their fairy tale to be true. Well, here's here's what makes me laugh, man, and all, and all amazing point. So, um, and I'll, I just want to say to the chat right now, um, ask one of us that are in control on uh, SFT, anyone with a mod, b before you block anybody, because um, SWE, who's nothing but uh, nice in the chat and provides super chats, and we we like her here for some reason was blocked. I have no idea who blocked. That would be stupid whore energy. So I'm gonna unblock her. So I don't know whoever blocked her. Just make sure you're not blocking unless you ask either Matt or Praise or myself. So it, anyways, back on point. So what you're saying, Matt, is a, is a great point. And I just laugh that this is what we're dealing with when it comes to people like Vice Rhino, Pelogia. They don't even understand their own model, okay? Because evolutionists explain, okay, they explain the origin of all genetic diversity as the result of what? Mutations over time. Then natural selection acts upon that genetic variation that is the result of mutations. That's why they say it takes a long time for large scale evolution and speciation events because those mutations have to accumulate. Mutations by definition add diversity. It's adding something that was not there before. But according to our model, the fact that God would have created animals, would have created Adam and Eve with millions of heterozygous DNA sites, okay? front loaded them with DNA uh, differences. That means like you were saying, Matt, the mechanisms of what? Recombination, gene conversion, that's all we need. And mutations can add a little bit of diversity, but time, because the evolutionists will oftentimes say, you know, there could not be a literal Adam and Eve because the accelerated mutation rates that would be required to explain the levels of genetic diversity we see today would have mutated them out of existence. It's impossible to account for the levels of genetic diversity today in the literal Adam and Eve 6,000 years ago. That assumes that Adam and Eve were not created with front-loaded genetic diversity. It doesn't make any sense that God, okay, theologically and scientifically would have created Adam and Eve genetically homogeneous with no DNA diversity. This makes no sense. If Vice Rhino wants to use this um, argument, Dr. Joshua Swamidas, who's a militant critic of young earth creation, has even said that, of course, God, assuming God, assuming our model, would have front loaded Adam and Eve with pre-existing genetic diversity. God said be fruitful and multiply. Would make no sense if God intended that to be carried out through cloning. Plus, it makes accurate predictions on DNA function, speciation rates, mutation rates, which Vice Rhino obviously has no idea about. And like we said earlier, if he wants to scoff at front loaded genetic diversity, answer my questions on origin of life and abiogenesis because your alternative is pseudoscience. It's been destroyed. So those genetic mechanisms like recombination, gene conversion, okay, this results in variation even according to the evolutionist model. Um, that's why it's so funny how when you look to breeds, you got all these breeds of dogs, you got all these breeds of Horses come to mind. I, I like to point out horses. There's over 800, uh, maybe between 750 and eight, 850 breeds of horses and donkeys in the world. Okay, you're looking at uh, horse, donkey, zebra family. I believe there's three species of zebras, one wild horse, three asses, seven species in total. Okay, well, we know that all of these breeds, if you ask yourselves, where did all these breeds come from? Well, they came about through artificial selection. Humans are responsible for 
producing them. Therefore, we can safely assume that all of these breeds, hundreds of breeds, have come from a common ancestor at some point in what human history of human humans are responsible for. But yet in the wild, all we have is seven species of equids and they want to scoff at how can you get all these species, you know, from a couple of art kinds just 4,500 years ago? Well, if those differences are built in, recombination, gene conversion, these genetic uh, type mechanisms can easily account for the number of species we see today, seven species of horses, but yet 700 breeds through simply reshuffling the genome. And yeah, some, some mutations can add some diversity, but he, wherever he learned that mutations could add the type of diversity that would explain biodiversity in the world, in the fossil record, he needs to go get his money back because mutations degrade. Mutations are overwhelmingly deleterious. They're not going to explain the phenotypic diversity, the amazing complexities we see in the biological world. So that's just one example that we can see on the farm with horses. Then we can go into dogs that shows the allelic potential within animals and the variations you can get simply by reshuffling those pre-existing DNA differences. So Vice Rhino is going to have a lot to answer for. <laughs> so it wasn't there an explosion of uh, canines too? Over a couple thousands of years, we have all these new um, species of dogs like in just a few thousand years. How does evolution explain that? Well, and, and exactly, because with artificial breeding, we're taking what's all already there and we're selecting certain traits, pre-existing DNA differences, reshuffling them. You know, they're, they're there in the gene code and we're just taking portions of that gene code and emphasizing it. That's what breeding is all about, right? So, but what's funny is the more um, information, the more allelic variability you have, like, for example, from a wolf to a chihuahua, okay, a chihuahua is not going to last in the wild, okay? You put all the chihuahuas today in the wild, and they will be dead in a week when it comes to natural selection, survival of the fittest. But from a wolf to a chihuahua, you're right, we've seen hundreds of dog breeds, okay, that all came from, you know, probably a, a few wolves, and ultimately, but what's funny is that's a reduction in allelic potential. You've lost genetic information to get that chihuahua. Yeah, aren't, aren't these uh, perfect observable examples? You know, you mentioned the horse, uh, uh, the equine, the, the dogs, uh, there's chickens, there's pigeons, canaries. They are the perfect observable example of heterozygosity. Right. What more? What more evidence can, can you want to demonstrate that heterozygosity actually is a real is a real model? Big, yeah, well, good point. Hey, go ahead, Matt. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, literally, they witness right um, a pit bull um, being uh, speciated or taken and forced into a Chihuahua breed. And they can never take the Chihuahua and go back to the original because once those shifts have been made, it's loss. Like remember, like the long hair, once it's bred out, it can never go back to having it again. But in their model, it should be because mutations are random and anything could happen. So therefore, they should be able to um, bounce back into that. But we know once it's shifted into that, into a homozygous state, recombination, nothing we can do can get it back ever. Yeah, correct. I, I was having... Uh... A discussion with Snake was right on in the comments section of uh, one video. I'm not sure which one it was, but uh, he, he stated there there wasn't any information loss. And I said, "Oh, really?" I go, "I'll give you two Chihuahuas. See if you can breed a German Shepherd out of those two Chihuahuas." Nice, good example. Yeah, yeah you can't. There's right. no way. It's true. Bottom of the bottom of the barrel. There is no way. You you're at the bottom of the barrel. You've you've reached a wall. And and that's what we say is the animal kinds at creation, the animal kinds on the ark, they would have had more genetic potential, more heterozygous gene size. And we can actually see that today because Dr. Jensen made a prediction, the one that's in this video, that speciation events would be taking place. And on a genotypic level, we'd be seeing shifts in heterozygosity to homozygosity 
we would be seeing obviously a, a population would have to break away, become isolated and genetically distinct enough to be considered a new species. He made this prediction based on the creation model that this is what we should see ultimately. And just that I believe is in 2017, I have the paper in front of me. I won't screen share for, for uh, sake of time. New finch species observed on the Galapagos Island after his prediction was made. And uh, genetically speaking, same thing, shifts from heterozygosity to homozygosity. And this would have been occurring since, you know, the creation event. Also, the new, the new research, Matt and I always talk about with DNA barcoding, that highly, highly conserved mitochondrial DNA protein, the uh, CO1 gene, extremely low genetic diversity in entire uh, swaths of all of biological life. And that research demonstrated that over 90% of all life has the same level of genetic diversity, meaning almost all life on earth has appeared at the exact same age. Now, what did they have to resort to as a rescue device to explain away the data, Matt, that is clearly in line with our model? Bottleneck, worldwide. Yeah. Bottleneck, always. Yeah, always. A worldwide one this time, water included, because the fish and aquatic life also suffered. Imagine that. What could have done that? Well, you know, that, that's what the empirical data um, shows us, that directly in, in, in um, when it comes to ancestry, we can see that it's consistent, confirms the biblical-based model. But he's going to talk more about uh, uh, molecular clocks. So before we – because, you know, we can talk about that forever. Maybe we'll wait for him to get to it first. <laughs> All right, here we go then. There is so much genetic evidence for 6,000 years that I don't even give it a second thought. Really? That's news to me, especially since molecular clock dating uses genetics to figure out when species diversified and has given us dates in the millions of years sometimes. Genetic data, millions of years. What he's talking about is phylogeny-based studies, okay, everybody? These are two different methods. He's talking about the popular one, the one that they use today. They started using this one and they finished using this one. The pedigree-based methods are what we use because they're the observable evidence. They're parent to daughter offspring and they are trio studies are um, dyads or triads. It doesn't really matter, but we don't need to uh, start out with an assumption of a most recent common ancestor like they do. We look at the observed rate and predictions can be made off of it. And that's what he's talking about. That's the only way you ever get millions of years. This will never get you even near one million years, ever. So uh, here's another. Yeah, correct, correct. The perfect example was the, um, the, the, the mitochondrial DNA study that suggested six, six and a half thousand years. They had to resort to... Um, the supposed evolution occurred and we have to look at our ancestors to calibrate that clock. And that's why they got 200,000 years. Actually, they, they, they had a number of uh, different uh, versions, 300,000, 200,000. They were all over the place until they could all agree on one particular one. Then they, then they I think they went with 200,000. <laughs> yes, I actually have that. Um, I'm going to show you what they used because that was in 1997 and that was uh, Thomas Parsons. And at the time when he did the study, they had narrowed the uh, bottleneck to 133,000 years. And I'll show you how he did his math. All right. This is what he's talking about. This is 6.5 million years ago. They expected a split. And they used, from that time, from 1979, fossil data to calibrate mitochondrial clocks in primates, okay? That's where they did it. All molecular clocks calibrated using that data, but not ours. We don't go by that. We don't believe in evolution, so we don't need that assumption starting point. All right, now the bottleneck prediction. What did they predict? Evolution predicted based on... 133,000 years ago was the bottleneck. So they looked and they said, okay, how many differences in substitution or at fixation in all human beings? 24 maximum. So they said, this is a retrodiction based on the belief that the last split, um, uh, most recent common ancestor from the bottleneck was 133,000 years ago. That would equate, divided by 24, would equate to one mutation every 12,000 years. What did we actually find? Now, we certainly. Oh, sorry. So 
Now I'll just continue with the video because we're just going to step all over the snow. Your clock dating has some issues and is nowhere near as reliable as radiometric dating, but the fact that molecular clock dating can even be attempted is itself good evidence for evolution. It relies on common ancestry and genetic relationships in order to work. Did you hear that? Yeah. There it is. Literally <laughs> admitted. It yeah. relies. It assumes that humans are related to chimps. And you're going to see it. He admits that calibration is required. When we look at mitochondrial DNA today in pedigree-based studies, okay, in dyads, triads, you name it, the mitochondrial DNA mutates fast. Okay, this is consistent with our model. When you look at a mitochondrial uh, DNA phylogenetic tree, for example, there's very little mutations there, easily explained in a biblical creation model going right back to Eve just 6,000 years ago. And mitochondrial DNA has incredibly low variation worldwide, just like the Y chromosome. Humans in general have uh, very low genetic diversity, which is exactly what we'd expect given a biblical creation starting point of God creating two people, Adam and Eve. What would we expect? One Y chromosome aligned, one mitochondrial DNA line, low genetic diversity. And guess what? This all happened to be true. This didn't have to be true. It had to be true for biblical creation. It didn't have to be true for evolution, but yet it came true. So why is our mitochondrial DNA so unique? Why is the Y chromosome so unique? You know, these are questions Vice Rhino would have to ask himself. Uh, George, I know you're going to speak there. Go ahead, brother. Oh, I was, I was just going to bring up something I heard Dr. Stadler say on, um, on uh, the LPP channel, um, what was it, last week or so. Uh, he, he sort of um, summarized it very, very um, simply. He said, we have no idea how it occurred, but we know it occurred. So it must have occurred because here we are. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah that's, that's one of their favorite answers. It's like yeah. a... <laughs> circular reasoning yeah well circular, that's correct yeah you can say it with anything well you know aliens made us how do we know because we're here look at us we don't match anything in nature there you go boom aliens did it it's proof <laughs> but you notice in these phylogeny based studies they admit that phylogeny and pedigree should produce the same estimations in mutation rates they don't they're right. very different from one another very different but doesn't the waiting um, waiting time and, and population genetics, doesn't that even pose a problem for phylogenetics anyway? The waiting time problem? Yes, by uh, Sanford. Yeah, but I thought there's other ones too. I thought there was another guy that had, uh, oh, I wish I could remember the guy's name, but uh, yeah, SFT's message. Yeah, it, it's not all. Yeah, you've got Haldane's dilemma. You know, how yep, long is it going to take yeah, for these Haldane. beneficial yeah. mutations yeah, to be fixated? So the, the waiting time problem, the newest one, I challenged uh, Vice Rhino. It's published in a secular journal, been read by 10,000 scientists. There's no feasible way, I mean, to fixate these numbers of mutations. And I mean, between humans and chimps, if you want to just give a conservative number, you're looking at like 30 million differences. You got to fixate that many differences in just 6 million years since the split. Huge waiting time problem, but uh, yeah, go ahead, uh, Matt. All right. Here, somebody admits that this was in 2000. They admitted that the phylogenetic rate is the one that's biased towards evolution, right? Because they know that the observed uh, pedigree rates are not biased. They're what we observe. So how could they be biased? They're admitting that their rate is the one that's biased because without the assumption, it doesn't even exist. You take it away, there is no evolution. That's it. It's based on this assumption that evolution is true. You take it away, it's gone. Oh, look at this. I didn't even do it right. Well-designed pedigree rates are more reliable than phylogeny approach. That's all it said. And many of these studies continue to rely on phylogenetic analysis of the control region for haplotypes. See, they admit that they're still using it to this day, but it's difficult to reconcile with a fossil record. Amazing, huh? They admit it. It doesn't make any sense with their own split, but therefore it doesn't really matter. And selection is unlikely to be a major factor. Now, isn't that ironic? Now, why would they rely on selection as a rescuing device. Remember, they said that, well, 
there's there were more mutations, but they were selected away. Selection removed them, and that's why we don't see them. And here again, he admits selection is unlikely to be a major factor from these differences. So there goes their own rescuing device. They they falsified themselves. I love it. So if we not genetically related, well, that's, we wouldn't. Well, I was going to say that's why I always point out, and 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 so do you, um, Matt, that molecular clock studies are truly on our side and that's why jensen always says that this is the direct measurement of ancestry this is why the evolutionists hate it and they always look to substitution rates they look to purifying selection they've got another uh, a number of explanations but it's so funny because even some of your pedigree based studies that give older dates maybe 20,000 years, 17,000 years. It's still it's still nowhere near their 150,000 years, 90,000. Dates are all over the place for Eve and, and Adam. It's still nowhere close. So how do they get there? Well, if you're going to use these rescue devices of selection, substitution rates, whatever, you name it, you're going to have to make, okay? So if Vice Rhino, if he's listening, here's a question I have for you. If you disagree with the Eve date, that we are talking about that is derived from what? The empirical method, which means straightforward mitochondrial DNA coalescence equations. Vice Rhino needs to make testable predictions. That's the gold standard of science. You know, how much is natural selecting acting upon these mutations? Uh, if he looks to time dependency, or substitution rates, you know, when does the molecular clock speed up and slow down, for example? Uh, regardless of whatever one he wants to employ, they're all using different ones, it seems. Without testable predictions, that rescue device is pseudoscience, and that's exactly what he has been pushing here. All these critics, they are failing to make accurate testable predictions, and the very man, Dr. Jensen, that he's criticizing, he's not even aware <laughs> of Dr. Jensen's Predictions. If I was here with him in a debate right now, I'd say, give me two predictions that he's made. It'll be silence. And then I'll tell him, well, Dr. Jensen has made predictions. He's made accurate retrodictions on mitochondrial DNA, but he's also made predictions. He said, I'm so confident with this mutation rate that I'm using that is based on the empirical method, the way we should be doing things. He has pointed at people groups in Africa, mainly, uh, you know, specific tribes, Khoisan peoples can, is one of them, for example. And he's predicting how fast they mutate, what their mutation rate is. So can Vice Rhino point to some people groups that we don't know their mutation rate yet? And can he make predictions? Also, Dr. Jensen is making predictions on the history of civilization as detected genetic signatures found in the mitochondrial DNA. Because if the mitochondrial DNA really does go back just 6,000 years, the history of civilization should be recorded in our DNA right? The Roman Empire, Genghis Khan Empire, Persian Empire. And he's already getting fascinating results. So uh, yeah, that's just a couple of predictions. And Vice Rhino is going to have to make some predictions of his own if he wants to attack that. It's just so funny how Vice Rhino, I laughed so hard when I first seen this, you know, right away, he's admitting you got to assume chimp human ancestry. You have to calibrate the data. You know, it's, 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 it's almost too easy. Yeah, this is too easy. It is, but it's okay because they they put themselves in the position to be slapped around, so that's fine. In a in a Nature article titled "Bones, Molecules, or Both," uh, this is what it states: Evolutionary trees from biological molecules often don't resemble those from morphology. It goes on to say, according to evolution, the molecular and morphological data should agree. They don't. That's the that's a nature article. Yeah. yeah, of course they don't, because reality is different. You see, you see it all the time. Yeah. Here, uh, real quick, actually, I'm going to share something real quick, just for I know everybody else has seen it, but um, when Vice Rhino watches that and then is too terrified to respond or debate, at least he'll see another thing that he can't refute. So. Um, here's a tree derived from mitochondrial DNA and you can see right off the bat, what do you get? Three major haplogroups, L, M, and N. Exactly what we'd expect given the biblical creation model after Noah's uh, flood, who steps off the ark? Eight, eight people. We got three reproducing couples 
And lo and behold, we've got L, M, and N, which should represent um, Noah's three daughters-in-law, for example, the wives of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, what you would be seeing here is a record of the history of civilization. This is all a record. This is all DNA differences. For example, DNA differences are a marker of time. So this should all reflect for the last 4,500 years since um, since the ark, obviously. The differences separating L, M, and N, of course, would be pre-flood mutations. The lines radi radiating out then should represent post-flood mutations. So the point is, we can make testable predictions now. Evolutionists, so Vice Rhino, you know, um, what he can do is he can then assert that this is all a reflection of 200,000 years. Well, that means, okay, if it really is a reflection of 200,000 years, that means the last 4,500 years to 6,000 years, that's just the, the tip of a needle. It's nothing. You're not going to be able to detect genetic signatures. You're not going to be able to differentiate signal from noise. But if it really is a reflection of the last 4,500 years here, okay, all of these DNA differences, then we should be able to detect genetic signatures. And uh, the predictions are, are working well. Dr. Jensen has an active research program. Vice Rhino clearly didn't know about it. <laughs> you know, So it, it's fascinating how we've got traces of Adam, Eve, Noah, uh, Noah's three daughters-in-law, we, we find it, signatures in our genetics. So S SFT, there we go. Stop sharing. SFT, SFT, you mind telling uh, the audience what the length of those lines represent? Because I'm sure yeah, not so many of them. Yeah, go yeah ahead. so the longer lines would indicate more mutation. So that's why they'll po point to the longest lines and they'll point to Africa, right? They'll say, well, Africa, the African branches have the longest lines and therefore the most mutations. Um, when in fact, when you look at the entire phylogenetic tree, even considering the African lines, the non-African lines, genetic diversity, overall, we have low genetic diversity. And African diversity can easily be explained through um, different generation times, different population histories, um, tribes, for example, we know Africa, uh, Africans lived in small tribes. Small populations, of course, can uh, lead to accelerated uh, rates of, of fixation due to genetic drift. There's a number of explanations, right? And that's why Jensen is making the predictions. He's saying that the Khoisan peoples, people in Africa are mutating faster based on generation times that are faster and, and a number of factors too. But yeah, that's a good question. So the, the yeah. length of the lines represent DNA differences. DNA differences are a reflection of mutations. Yeah, many many of those tribes actually marry younger as well. I mean, I, I come from a village in the northern part of a specific country where it was common for girls to get married at 16. So that's, that's another right. uh, uh, explanation. There Boom. Yeah. There you go. So if, if your generation time, you know, if people are getting married at 15, 16, you're going to have more mutations that accumulate. Um, and Matt actually did a great job in, what was it, two videos ago with Guts and Gibbon? Because she was scoffing at the generation time um, explanation. Isn't that right, Matt? Yeah, she didn't like the generation time that um, Dr. Jensen used in one of his uh, models, but it was a prediction that he had made. So he can use any number that he wants. It's not like he went in, found the information and said, oh, it'll work perfect if I just make it 15 years. <laughs> Did the opposite. So, yeah, it's typical. It's all right. It's, it's typical. And the thing is, we're not seeing any. What's funny is all of these critics, like even like your, your PhD, like Dan, right? They're making no predictions of their own. They're not addressing, like, just like with the Y chromosome data that has um, recently come out with the confirmed predictions on the Y chromosome um, history of civilization that Dr. Nathaniel Jensen is um, is, is doing. And, and those haplogroups you've seen, uh, because D George asked a good question, I pointed out, but I want to make it clear that the small lines that would be connecting those three major haplogroups would be pre-flood time. And that's why when you're looking at the lines radiating out from those three major haplogroups, that's going to be the post-flood history. 
And that's why if all of uh, humanity, all of us ultimately descend from Noah's three daughters-in-law, that's why we should theoretically be able to detect genetic signatures. So it is all very technical, but the point is, it is a future testable prediction. It has led to an active research program. It's working incredibly well. Dr. Jensen has just released uh, a couple papers, one specifically on the Y chromosome, because it's the same deal with the Y chromosome. So um, the gold standard of science is testable predictions. Vice Rhino scoffs at creationists that we're not making testable predictions and is clearly not up to date on these testable predictions. So not up to date at all. But it's like most of these guys, like you said, they're, they just scoff. They just stand back, make fun, you know, have their fans laugh. And that's about it. And they, and they just sit back in ignorance as they read from Google. So, <laughs> all right, here we go. Uh, can you screen share for me again? Oh, yes, my bad. Okay. Ooh. Don't worry, um, George. I also have that chart in this video as well. There we go. Okay. So if we were not genetically related to the great apes, we wouldn't even be able to attempt it. <laughs> it's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Sorry to use that word, but what does that mean about you know, who, who wrote this script for him? <laughs> I believe he's got it right now, yeah. So does that mean that these chickens that also didn't split from the great apes couldn't have their mutation rate checked by pedigree studies? Yeah. Because no. <laughs> oh, and what's funny is these guys are not doing it impromptu like us where we just jump in watch the video say what's on our mind kind of thing go on rabbit trails i mean he's literally writing a script and he's sounding ridiculous i know yeah it's so bad for him i mean look at what they had to resort to when they found that the molecular clocks there's only a certain amount of mutations they only they go well uh, you know, they only seem to go back about 200 400 generations <laughs> ironic <laughs> Just, oh, no. just so happy. What a coincidence. What yeah. a coincidence. Exactly. Here's another one. Look at this. Right back to the flood. Oh, and here's another one. I really like this chart because this shows you what he's talking about. All of these round circles are phylogeny based mutation rate. These gray lines are errors for margin or margins for error, I should say. And they this is how what they allow for discrepancies up here. This is the actual observed pedigree mutation rates, all of them put together, including ones that obtained zero substitutions. So every single one that they could compile together, pull together, bad studies and good studies are way up here in the actual range. And then all the nonsense is down here. Look at that. Reality, fake. What a difference, I tell you. Anyway, let's keep going. So, for example, this is what many people don't realize, even though evolutionists don't realize. We have in, our, in all of our cells, with few exceptions, DNA, and every generation, sperm and egg pass on DNA. The DNA changes. There's mistakes that happen. We live in an imperfect world. It's not copied perfectly. Well, that means it's a, it's a regular process. And so to have a clock, all you need is a regular repeating process. Every generation, changes happen. Oh, so it's molecular clock dating that even a lot of evolutionists are unaware of. You may be right, but as I said, molecular clock dating relies on common ancestry in order to work. In fact, to get it to work, you need to first have a pretty well-established date for a speciation event in order to calibrate it. So did you just say you mean <laughs> more yes. assumptions? There's the circular reasoning again. Yeah. He doesn't Species. even realize that he's so indoctrinated. Yeah. So, so we have to we have to calibrate now with the assumed geological column and the dates associated with it. Well, guess what? These accurate predictions that are coming out from the creation side is not based on assuming the deep time in the geological column. We're looking at the empirical rate and we're making testable predictions based on the empirical rate and the empirical method. But he's admitting, what, two, three times? And it's funny because he hasn't dealt with us yet. So he's just digging himself into a, a hole that he's never going to be able to climb out of. But it's assumption, assumption. That's why he won't come back with future novel testable predictions. The best that they've come up with was from damage control, Dan, Dan, the pseudoscience man, that we completely expose as a non-novel prediction. <laughs> so good luck, bud. Yeah, exactly. And what's funny <laughs> too, is he literally admitted that humans speciated when humans have never speciated. So I find that funny. 
but here we go. Yeah. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you every single one of these studies to show you he doesn't know what he's talking about. And what we're looking at here is we're talking about uh, one or two mutations after eight generations or di uh, we could just call it. Um, yeah, that's called generation times. So this would work out to be one out of 44. And so what this means is these are substitutions. And this is what the mutation rate is actually based on, because this is what matters the most when we're looking at differences in people. So we're going to start with Howell in 96, and then we're going to go to uh, Bindal, and then Mum, and then Parsons. We're going to go down each one right now. I'm going to show you what I'm going to show you, explain these things for you real quick. So here's the first one. It was uh, how he obtained one mutation every 25 generations. OK, that was the first one done. And this study was probably in 1996. And then in 1996, again, Ben Dahl came out. He got four out of 360, which works out to be a bit different. Uh, one, one in 90. Perfect. Yeah, one out of 90. So different but the reason why is you can see it right here oh i'm sorry um let me just rewind a little bit i keep having trouble okay ah i don't think i got it it's very hard to rewind on this thing there we go he looked at the hyper variable region one when you look at only one region, you're never going to see all of the substitutions that are occurring or all the mutations, I should say. So these substitutions that are occurring need to be looked at in the entire control region. So he looked inside the entire or she looked inside the um, control region and only looked at one of the regions inside of that region and then only looked at part of the segment of that region so she only collected a small fraction of what was seen and it looks like it's slower because of that so here's the actual study and as i mentioned and they reported two out of 170 which basically worked out to be that um Pendal assumed that one half of the heteroplasmic mutations detected in their pedigree analysis would not become homeoplastic for their new alleles that assumption however is not supported by any experimental evidence so what they assumed to be true was later found out to be wrong which again slowed down the mutation rate clock in that study that's why they got it so different their approach used will not capture newly arising heteroplasmic mutations Who's allele. So what does that mean? Heteroplasmic mutations speed the mutation rate clock up because you're seeing diversity. You're, you're catching and looking at all the different mu um, mitochondria that's in a single human being and you're, you're accounting for them. You're calculating up their mutations that are building up, or I should say their substitution. Here's what this looks like. So here's the entire mitochondria. And what they do is they go to right here. This is the control region. It's also known as the D loop. They go over to the hypervariable region one, and they go right here. It's about this many base pairs long. And it's a little bit larger than a hypervariable segment two or hypervariable region. They call it different things. It's a little bit smaller, but because of the larger size, it also is faster than the hypervariable uh, region two. So when you're only looking at one, you're only seeing half the mutations that are in this region. So when you're looking for an accurate mutation rate, you have to look at the actual segment that's, co that's collecting them or else you're not going to see them all. That's why different studies obtain different rates. It's because most of the time, these studies are not originally trying to gather a mutation rate. They are, um, they are doing it for another reason. They're either looking at family relations. They're looking for heteroplasmic disease. And it's secondarily looking at a mutation rate. So here's the biggest problem is they pull all these studies together. And then they say, well, look at the mutation rate clock. Let's see what it comes out to be. Well, that's stupid. That's like um, comparing apples and oranges. You're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to look at what's accurate, and most studies aren't actually trying to do that. Parsons was, and he's next. So, But before we get to him, look, another study, a little bit higher on the rate. Again, um, not, not low, but not high either. doesn't even come near what evolutionists need. And again, what do we see? One region, one segment, and a part of the segment of the hypervariable region one not collecting the entire full data yet again. Why? The study was not designed or intended to investigate mutation rates. It was designed to verify that two family members were related. Then, like Mom and Bendal here, they only looked at the one region. That's the problem. So again, we have another study that didn't try to get a mutation rate. They were doing something else, 
And then they obtained a mutation rate. So what did they do? Well, the scientists came along later and they said, well, let's pull it together because they have a mutation rate. Stupid. Let's go on to Parsons now. Oh, look at this. He tested both like you're supposed to do. What did he get? Oh, uh, look at that. Only one out of every 32 generations of mutation rate. Well, how many substitution fixations are there? Remember, 24 in total. Multiply that sometime. What are you getting here? That's the real answer right there. Hey, Matt, look at uh... – Look at Ian Chen. So I'm going to answer one question that he had because he, he said he's not familiar with any predictions yet. So we'll explain. It, I mean, how funny is that? But he also said this, Matt. <clears throat> SFT made me read the papers on this. One of the criticisms on Jensen is he uses the D loop and extrapolates to the entire mtDNA. What do you say to that, brother? That is because the entire mitochondria – uh, it does mutate, but it's a little bit different, but it doesn't matter because they all converge on each other. You can go inside the entire mitochondria and pull out one of the 37 genes and test them for mutation rate. And again, they, they show the exact same consistency. So it really doesn't matter where you look, but the D right. loop makes the most sense to study because of its size. You don't have to study a 16,569 base pair region. You are literally looking at that little tiny segment of base pairs and it collects the same amount of, of, of information. So why would you waste your time looking at a higher region that's going to give you the same results? That's why. So I hope that See, and it's funny how he – well, it, it, oh, it answers it. It's been answered. And what's funny is I gave him a really, really deta detailed response maybe a week ago from um, – actually from Jensen himself who talks about all of the numbers of studies, not one, not two, not three, not four. I mean a number of studies that have been published that are all consistent, all consistent um, – across multiple independent scientific studies, and yet he didn't even um, deal with it. And also, I pointed out the fact that he didn't give any answer. Um, why does mitochondrial DNA clock in humans point to a young genome and reject millions of years time scale, but also in many other species where the mitochondrial DNA has actually been measured? For example, the fruit fly, roundworm, water flea, yeast, all of these mitochondrial DNA mutation rates all strongly corroborate on one key answer and conclusion. And then all of this data leading to testable predictions on the history of civilization, which I just explained in detail. And I've explained, he said he just got here. So, you know, that's no excuse because I've explained it in detail over and over again in the fact that Ian, you know, well, make sure you're listening. If this is indeed true, that for the Y chromosome and the mitochondrial DNA, that the DNA differences that we see, okay, mitochondrial DNA mutates fast. This is given. There's not a lot of mutations when you look at it visually in a phylogenetic tree. I mean, the average person is roughly 20, 25 mutations apart from the mitochondrial DNA sequence. Most is about 100, 120. Easily explainable in 6,500 years. Ian, you're in the comments section right now. And this is good because we're just going to destroy objections that Vice Rhino, well, Vice Rhino doesn't seem educated enough to have any rebuttal. So, but uh, Ian, how are you going to explain such little differences in the mitochondrial DNA? To account for your hundred to two hundred thousand year data, I means pull out the storyboard there, buddy. But um, <laughs> when it comes to the history of civilization, that's what I love: the Y chromosome dissimilarity. Trying to explain how you can get so few DNA differences, yet the mitochondrial DNA mutates fast. Ian, any any time, my man, I'll give you the link. You come in here and you uh, defend your position. But I want to know detailed story. I've discussed it with CRISPR, and you should have seen his storyboard. He should win awards for it in order to. Um, account for why there are so few differences. But here's the thing that Ian always forgets, the history of civilization. If these DNA differences, which are a marker of time, only go back 4,500 years for the Y chromosome and 6,000 to 6,500 years for the mtDNA, then we should be able to detect genetic signatures, okay? Testable predictions have been made. A new Y chromosome paper has recently come out 
suggesting that genetic signatures have been detected in the Y chromosome. If deep time evolution is true and the DNA differences in the Y chromosome are a reflection of 200,000 years, it should be nothing but noise, okay? There should be no detectable signal. Ian, why is there a signal detected? And why aren't evolutionists making predictions on DNA stamps and genetic signatures in the Y chromosome and mitochondrial DNA? Answer it right now. He won't. He won't, but go ahead. And then also, and actually, George, you can touch on this one too. We can get into we can get into genetic. Uh, we can get into DNA function related predictions. I asked him in the chat just now. I said, Ian, reiterate to me the prediction on um, cytochrome C and these highly highly conserved mitochondrial DNA proteins that Jensen is making regarding nested hierarchical patterns. Do they reflect design or do they reflect descent? Uh, Jensen's got a number of DNA related predictions. Let's see if he can reiterate it. I predict not. Another one, geology. George, if you want, you could touch on this too. This one's been confirmed. One of the predictions of catastrophic plate tectonics, right? The fountains of the great deep break open, plates are moving, uh, moving vertically, horizontally, catastrophic process is taking place. Therefore, if these plates are being pushed down, okay, they haven't had time to melt. Dr. John Baumgartner, a geophysicist, okay, a geophysicist who's published numerous secular papers. Ian, how many have you published? Ian, answer this question. He made a prediction that if this is true, okay, we should find huge slabs of cold rock at the base of the mantle, okay, because they would not have had time to melt yet. Then, years later, this new field of science comes out. It's called seismic tomography. With this new form of science, what did we learn? Lo and behold, we learned that massive slabs of cold slabs of rock are at the base of the mantle, which means they've been pushed down there recently and have not melted. This is just one of the many predictions that have confirmed the global flood model. Rapid magnetic reversals was predicted by um, Russell Humphreys. That came true as well. So uh, how do you explain that data there, Ian? And uh, I understand why you don't jump into these live streams because I would make you look like... Um, you know, how, it's sillier than you look in the comment section. So it's just, it, it's irritating because explaining the same things over and over again to atheists who say they watch our channel all the time, but they can't reiterate a simple prediction. I mean, I just went nonstop in one breath and named what, four or five predictions? You want me to name 10? Like these guys got to start listening. I don't know what's... What, 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 they're complaining that we're using the uh, the uh, the mitochondria. It's like no evolutionists are using the mitochondria. What are you talking about? They're the ones that found it to be the best. So you're complaining that your own people are using a molecular clock that discovered mutation rates and beneficial benefit of us, and then you're mad at us for it. That's insanity. First of all, why do they use the mitochondria for a testing area? Well, it doesn't repair itself. It's like trying to test muscle to determine how old you are. It's stupid because it would repair itself and you wouldn't get accuracy. But because the mitochondria doesn't repair itself, it makes the perfect area to test. It's not because it's fast. It just happened to be fast because mutation rates are fast and that's the reality of thing. It's true. And they can't, they can't say, oh, well, why don't you test another region? Well, for the very reason that it repairs itself. They found a control region inside the mitochondria that was the most accurate to test because it's small, it's quick, and it's cheap, rather than testing the entire mitochondria, which is more expensive and gives you the same results. And guess what? It doesn't repair itself, and it's extremely fast. That's why they use it. That's why we use it. So by uh, complaining uh, to us, you're complaining about yourself. Yeah, I'm not if I'm not sure if um, you're going to cover the section of that video on uh, predictions, but either the, either these guys don't do their homework or they're being totally dishonest and disingenuous because they talked about predictions, but yet if they read if they read Dr. Jensen's papers and especially his book Replacing Darwin, there's heaps of predictions in there. So so it's it's either being dishonest or disingenuous or or just being idiotic and not doing their homework. I know. It's, well, here's yeah. the issue too, is a lot of them are very technical. Like this history of civilization prediction, I I had to study, like I've read Replacing Darwin thoroughly. I had to study it. I had to look at all these phylogenetic trees. I had to read through Jensen's papers. It, th these predictions are oftentimes not easy to even explain. 
I mean, he's got an active research program where he's he imagines doing it full time. So, you know, when you explain it over and over again, eventually you kind of just hope that the critic, if they're really uh, genuine, they will go and pick up replacing Darwin or by some other means, go study the prediction themselves. You know what I mean, George? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you, me you mentioned, uh, I think you mentioned radiometric dating there. Yeah. As one of the um, methods to to show evolution, but I'm not sure whether you want to touch up on that, whether you want to move on yeah. to the next yeah. argument. Yeah, George, if, if if you wanted to, well, I guess Matt, if you want to finish with the um, no, with what you're yeah. saying, and then George, and uh, George, I want you to take some. George, I'd love to for you to. Um, you wrote a section on on diamonds, which was phenomenal. Did you want to touch on that uh, specific topic? Well, I was just going to bring up a section. So, so I'm not accused of uh, misrepresenting here. It comes straight from the National Nuclear Security Commission. They, they state uh, secondary deposits form due to the leaching of uranium from minerals during chemical weathering. Uranium is mobile in groundwater, but is readily precipitated by humic acids in soils. It may be found in carbonized plant or animal remains and may also fill openings in porous soils. So straight off the bat, you can see that radiometric dating is subject to contamination purely via, via the movement of groundwater. So that's, that's why I, I, I tell people I don't trust any radiometric dating uh, that's, that's done because, uh, because of that problem. And, and the classic example is the stuff up at the KBS Tuff. Uh, I'm sure you guys have heard of the KBS Tuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so that's all I wanted to say on radiometric dating, but it's it's a whole subject altogether. And and I know uh, SFT has, has covered it on on a, a separate video to this, uh, and, it, and it was very well done, by the way. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we touch on the subject a lot because that's one of their main arguments when it goes to how old the th things are. You know, they, they're, they're quick to say evolution only has to do with biology. And then you go, what's your best evidence? They go, radiometric dating. <laughs> well, so, I'll, I'll, I'll cover carbon-14 carbon in diamonds uh, at, towards the end, if you like. Right. I don't want to interrupt uh, the rest of the video. So keep, keep, keep uh, rolling the video, I guess. Okay, uh, I'll finish up here. I'm still going on. I kind of go on a tangent here because a lot of this section was on molecular clocks. So yeah, take your time, Matt. Just it, it hit it hard, brother. Leave no stone unturned. Okay, as we're working our way through these studies, we finally got into 1997, where this is Parsons now, and he came along and he decided I'm going to only do a study based on mutation rates, and I'm not going to use and assume. Um, you know, evolution, even though he does in his mathematical calculations, he didn't, he, he still looked at the observable mutation rate. So this was really good because he used massive amounts of studies and he got 10 mutations every 327 transmissions. And uh, we're going to look up, oh, I'm sorry. One second. Oh. Uh, <laughs> and, um, Sorry about that. Sidetracked the baby. Uh, all right, here, let me hit play. Okay, here we go. We see it right here. One in 33 generations. You Assuming a generation time of 20 years gave him his mutation rate, and that is where we get the 6,500-year time frame from. But creationists usually don't like to poke too many holes in molecular clock dating because of that one article that used a faster-than-expected result for mitochondrial DNA mutation rates to calculate mitochondrial Eve's date at 6,000 years ago, right before explaining how that's not actually possible. But what creationists won't tell you is that even if that 6,000-year number was correct, it was arrived at based on the assumption of our common ancestor with chimps living about six to seven million years ago. <laughs> uh, so how did Parsons come up with that date? Again, he even used evolution uh, to help in his calculations. I wrote it right here. And what did he do? Well, I talked about it earlier. He used, at the time, the most recent common ancestor from a bottleneck, came 133,000 years ago, divided by 20%, got boom, got his date. That's it. Real simple. Mitochondrial Eve likely lived between 99,000 and 148,000 years ago. Well, 
I like this because this shows you the reality between the different two. Uh, we haven't gone through all the studies yet, but I threw this in just so you can see. What is he talking about? Wh which one of these studies is he going to go by? This one? This one? This one? <laughs> you know what I mean? The dates are all over the place. All over the place. Look at this one. Up to 300,000. Look at this one. Down to 72. That's accurate. Anyway, let's keep going. Uh, looks like I put that one in before. Oh, here, read this one real quick with me. For example, researchers have uh, calculated that mitochondrial Eve, the woman whose empty DNA was ancestral to all living people, lived 100,000 to 200,000 years ago in Africa. Using the new date, she'd be a mere 6,000 years old. Now, read the bottom. No one thinks that this is the case. But at what point should our uh, models switch from mutational empty DNA time zones to otherwise? I'm worried. They're worried about it. You know why? Because reality is a horrible thing, isn't it, guys? The truth hurts. Now, remember when he said nobody agrees with this study? Well, here's one for you. They completely agreed with each other. So, so much for that one. Both of our studies and his, this is Hal talking, got the same results. They got 25 uh, to 40 mutations. Here's another one. Look at this one. Notice something? They, they looked at both regions and got zero mutations after 108 generations. That's odd, isn't it? No mutations. Let's see what they got from it, though. Though they didn't see any occur, the reason why is because they were studying in a, a particular family that had no mutations going on between it. So they used one mutation every 36 transmission events to go along with the probability and got their actual mutation rate from this. And this is what we saw. The, um, from the number of families, they only looked at five families and they were related. So they didn't see any mutations because they were highly deleterious and they were selected against and removed because that's what happens to really harmful mutations. Uh, and uh, you don't see any substitutions that way. So they got theirs and look at this. Look at the consistency. Oh, everything's very, very consistent. But let's continue on. OK, uh, the next one. Why? Why is this? Ah, zero substitution. Look at what Parsons says about it. The control region, for example, promotes replication and transcription of empty DNA. So any mutation that interferes with the efficiency of this process might be deleterious and therefore selected against, reducing the apparent mutation rate. So that's why, and even Parsons debunked it. Again, another study, study that should have never been included with mutation rates because they didn't even get results because they were studying an inbred island family that selection was removing mutations from. Another, Parsons and Holland came out together this time and they got a fast mutation rate just like he did in his first year. Now, another study came along. Look at this one. Another one didn't catch any mutations. That's peculiar. Let's find out why, though. Ah, oh, I jumped into another one. Um, sorry, I didn't cover that one in this video for some reason. All right, sorry, I threw this together in like an hour or two, so I kind of messed up. But again, you will find the consistency. Anytime you see a mutation rate study that has zero as a result, just go investigate it. If they're all free, you can get them on YouTube real easy. All right, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, on Google. And you will find the consistency in that they were always a related family, all a single people group. Uh, they either tested a small region or a small segment and people were either identical twins or they were related or something like that every single time. This study is funny because it's a more recent one. And out of 320 and transmission, we detected 11 substitution. What does that remind you of? That's exactly like Parsons, identical. And this is a more recent one. However, they considered mutations that were probably not going to be passed on. So they reduced it by half because they believe evolution to be true. So they took the actual reality and they removed the reality in favor of evolution, even though this study here claims that what they did was wrong because heteroplastic mutations in their lineages were inherited multiple generations and therefore they sh cannot be somatic. See, they counted, they thought they should have been somatic and should have removed them. Somatic variants are undeniable. Even in the study by, reported by Parsons, which analyzed small pedigrees, a newly arising mutations were detected in multiple family members and thus cannot be somatic. See? So more evolutionary assumption ruins them. They can't think for themselves. Hayer, one of the last studies I'm going to talk about here. 
tested two regions, got four substitutions after uh, 408, uh, 508. What does this rely to? Look at that. 200 generations ago, 6,600 years for the first region, combined with hypervariable region two for 276 generations ago. This study was done only on Europeans. So that means that this would be Noah's sons off the ark when they became the European lineage. So that's Japheth's line. And what does that go to when you multiply it? You, uh, I'm sorry, when you take those two numbers. And, and over and over again, what we see. In a okay, I finished there. So what happens when you take those 220 generations and 275 and you combine those two, you get about 245 generations ago. You land right on Japheth. Uh, giving birth to his, the European lineage. And that shows you directly looking at both hypervariable full length regions. So we have multiple studies showing that the empirical evidence lands on exactly what we would expect. And any time you get evidence that doesn't align with it, just investigate it and you'll find it has evolutionary assumptions riddled in the study. Well, and, and it's perfect with this video because <clears throat> Good old Vice Rhino <laughs> literally admits the assumptions right in the right in his video. And what's funny is, you know, his audience, since they can't think for themselves, lacking critical thinking skills, this isn't all atheists or evolutionists, you know. But definitely his audience, they're just gonna watch the video. It's gonna be in one ear and out the other. They're gonna say, Oh, creation's debunked. They're not even gonna notice the circular reasoning. Um, but everything you just said there, um, brother Matt, you know, I couldn't have said it better than myself. Incredibly detailed. They, they can't refute it. They can't refute the mitochondrial DNA. They can't answer the question, you know, vice rhino. When you listen to this with a tear rolling down your cheek, you know, answer me the question. Why is the mitochondrial DNA sequence? Mitochondrial Eve, why is it so unique? It didn't have to be this unique. Yeah, they resort to the hypothetical out of Africa population bottleneck, but there was every chance possible that the mitochondrial DNA ancestor could have shared many lines with chimpanzees if we actually share relationship with them. But in fact, what we see is one female ancestor based on the empirical method only goes back a few thousand years it turns out that all we really find is about 20 to 30 mutations that separate most people in the world today from our Eve ancestor. All of this did not have to be true, but it just turned out to be true. How do they explain such little uh, mutations? It's crazy. Yeah, exactly. That's one of their biggest problems is the mutation rates are fast. There's few fixed differences and they don't align with phylogeny, which is their assumption method, right? So we'll continue on here. DNA is abundant evidence. There isn't enough DNA differences for us to have been around hundreds of thousands, millions of years. It looks like we arose just 6,000 years ago. That depends entirely on how you calculate the neutral mutation rate. I'm fairly confident that he's referring to the article talking about mitochondrial Eve existing 6,000 years ago based on two studies that found an unusually high mutation rate. No, he's talking about his own study. That's how little this guy knows. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah! Look, he even he even demonstrated that the new mute, uh, the D loop mutation is consistent. But it's worth anyway mentioning that those studies are outliers. The measured mutation rate is generally about seven times slower than those two studies found. Okay, what he's talking about is the Amish people. Now, when Parsons was doing his study, he noticed that when he looked into the forensic paperwork, he noticed that they were about four times faster than the average. Then he looked at the Am Amish people, and he found that they have a slower rate, about seven times slower. So he didn't just like separate them all out. He combined them all together and said, let's find out what we discovered. So he actually did what you're supposed to do. He took, okay, well, these are way slower and these are a little bit faster. Let's combine them because that's reality, right? Some people groups are going to be slower. Why would the Amish people be slower? Well, they're a small population that intermarry. So what would you find with that problem? Well, guess what? Harmful deleterious mutations from intermarrying would be selected away, wouldn't they? Exactly. That's why they have a slower mutation rate because you can't see the mutations. That's why they're slower. It's not because they are slower. It's because you don't see them. Anyway, let's continue. This was just a study I found recently. 2022, by the way. 
Anyway, Parsons found that <laughs> way. I'm sorry, what? No, I was just going to say, it doesn't get any better than that, 2020. <laughs> I know, right? And, and now here's the pedigree studies reported, right? They range from zero to 50. Remember, the lowest you can find from that garbage study done here to 50 right. being the highest, right? So uh, they didn't even get 50. Howell got 25 and Parsons got um, 32 and 33, uh, right around there. Um, Howell uh, came back in, in 2003 and got one out of 40 one out of 45, but let's just say 50 is the highest. Grab your calculator, everyone. Let's determine what that is real quick, okay? We go for 24 fixed um, mutations and uh, times uh, 50 and then 1,200. So um, that's, that's how many generations would have occurred at the highest end, 1,200 generations ago, using the highest estimate of observed rates. Let's say that the generation time is, uh, give me a year, 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, give me whatever you want, I'll pop, I'll pop it in. Anything? Okay, 25 it is then. That's 30,000 years ago, okay? At the highest estimate, including studies that got zero. So 30,000 years ago is the farthest they can push this back using the, the rates. How does that help evolution? It doesn't. What bottleneck was between now and 30,000 years ago that would reduce all humans to one female? Nothing. That's your answer. Let's keep going. Oh, here we go. There's the chart again. Three da daughters of Noah, right? I, Noah's daughter-in-law. Okay, well, here was the African line. Lots of diversity. They assume lots of time. So I made uh, uh, a uh, little th illustration here for you at looking at the top. Here's the Q haplo group, which shows the migration from Asia over to North America, looking at Native Americans who migrated down and came into South America. We know that this migration happened at exactly the same time, and the, and the South American people got here, and they started to diversify. They arose at the same time, and they filled up South America. But when we look at the mute substitution differences, we find that some have a lot of more fixed substitutions and some don't. Now, why would that be if this is a, of a, uh, a chart of time? It's not. That's the thing. The chart shows substitutions because they're based on fixation of population size. That's why you find more substitutions here and here in smaller tribes than when you get down to here when the people groups were massive like the Aztecs and Mayans. You're not going to reach fixation in high population groups. So you get little diver uh, you get little substitution fixations. Over here, you get massive amounts of these substitution fixations. So to evolutionists, they see these lines and they go, wow, look at this. They've been here for hundreds of thousands of years longer. That's wrong because we know this chart is only based on the 1000 Genome Project. So it's only looking at differences. That's it. So let's break this down into a little analogy. More like let's imagine a person taking a step. Every single time they take a step up a pyramid, um, they, that's a new mutation, or I'm sorry, a new substitution reaching fixation. So you have to bigger the group, the larger the pyramid, the harder it is to reach the top, to reach fixation. The smaller the people, the faster it is to get to the top of a little pyramid to reach fixation. So there's more differences in smaller people groups and less differences in larger ones. It's not time. That's the evolutionary assumption and genetics destroys them. Let's continue. I might have ended. That might be enough for me. But Now, I'm skipping a section where they both ramble on. For I love that analogy there with the pyramid, Matt. I just wanted to point that. Oh, thanks. I wanted to be give, give more visuals. Well, I added that to my book, too, by the way. Addressing when we come back in is the claim that creationists don't make testable predictions. He said that creationism does make testable predictions and then didn't provide any examples. And Pause that real quick, Matt. Yeah. Well... <laughs> I guess we did spend, what, uh, 15, 20 minutes there going over the number of testable predictions. I want to point out one thing that's funny. This is like a pure flex interview um, with Dr. Jensen. I think it's like total 30 minutes, 20 minutes maybe. 
as if he's supposed to give a complete rundown of the extremely technical testable predictions found in replacing Darwin. Like, for example, the predictions on the history of civilization in the Y chromosome mitochondrial DNA. Could you imagine Jensen spending 20 minutes there explaining it to the host? I mean, you know, these are highly technical predictions that possibly even if Vice Rhino were to read through them or I were to explain it to him, he may not even understand them. No. Or me. Praise <laughs> <laughs> your. No, he's, What's a that about? no, he's a Harvard grad. He has his own study. You know what I mean? I mean, he, he's he's in there doing constant things. I mean, he's talking about things that most people have no clue about. He doesn't want to be boring on a talk show. He wants to be take it lighthearted and have it be yeah. for. You know, that's what makes Ken Hovind so popular. Oh. Simple. Right, he keeps it we on the fifth him to grade come level. On the show. Well, we've got. Are you talking about Hoven or Jensen? Jensen, man, we need Jensen yeah. on the channel. Wow, that'd be something else. Yeah, he's a he's a beast, and you know what, Vice Rhino, he's going to have to address the history of civilization predictions. He'll have to address or make his own predictions. We talked about it earlier on mitochondrial DNA. Make predictions on mutation rates in people groups where we don't know their uh, mutation rate yet. The, the Jensen's done it. We've done it. Um, how do you explain the catastrophic plate tectonics predictions that have uh, been confirmed on the cold slabs? rapid magnetic reversals. What about the predictions coming from the rate team where they went in? And uh, if you want to touch on any of this too, George, I know you're great on this topic. They went in looking for evidence in the rocks for accelerated nuclear decay. And they came out discovering what? That rapid nuclear decay had occurred. They found evidence in zircon crystals. Helium's incredibly slippery. Why is it still being found in zircon crystals that are what? Millions to billions of years old? Should all have been dis should all be gone. Fish and tracks, radio halos. This is all observable in the ev uh, evidence in the rocks that nuclear accelerated nuclear decay has occurred and dna prediction after dna prediction dna function we're predicting that many of these dna elements like the ervs the retro transposons the alus uh these areas that they assume are junk we're saying based on this created heterozygosity hypothesis we would say that the vast majority of the genome these dna elements are functional now because of genetic entropy there would still be some junk but as you know from discussing this topic with PhDs, Dr. Dan or Dan Grar, I mean, these uh, critics, these evolutionists, they're pretty adamant that the genome can't be any more than 20%, 25%, 15%. Well, we're predicting it's a lot more than, than that. And we, we know that simply just based off the conserved regions in the genome. They never predicted th this many conserved regions that are obviously being maintained by natural selection because they are functional. The epigenome, they never predicted uh, this. They never predicted the results from ENCODE that's, that's suggesting a significant amount of biochemical activity, you know, going on in the genome. And if this is just useless activity, why is it all being transcribed? You know, the cell doesn't transcribe useless information. And if the vast majority of these ALUs or DNA elements Retro transposons, if they were just junk, they should be uh, being seen to um, be mutated into oblivion. No, they're being maintained. They're functional to the genome. So we've got future testable prediction after future testable prediction. Uh, George, what are your thoughts, brother? Well, I was going to add those um, radio halos, the zircons, etc. That's all empirical evidence, and uh, they completely deny the very science they say they they actually support and they'll 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 come back with uh, stories um, assumptions conjecture to explain it away that's pretty pretty well, much, that's pretty much it we, we give him we give him empirical evidence they give us a story you just don't understand <laughs> evolution yeah, yeah no, <laughs> I don't. Don't understand. you're right i don't george that's where's your nobel say. prize there buddy <laughs> Where's your Nobel, yeah, Nobel Prize? Yep, they always bring that one up. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Why do most people believe in evolution? Consensus, argument from consensus. <laughs> yeah, the consensus says evolution's a fact. 100% fact. fact. 
Like literally just one of the lines of evidence, observable evidence in the rock. Uh, George, you always talk about it. Like I said, the helium that diffuses so rapidly that all yeah. this helium should have leaked out in, in less than give it a hundred thousand years. Why are these rocks still full of helium atoms? Answer that question there, Vice Rhino. And don't pull out the storyboard. We don't care about the assumptions. We don't care about the storyboard. You know, explain yeah. all of the <laughs> there's and mountains the, and, of evolution there. There's mountains of evidence the, for it. And the best part of that uh, SF, the best part of that SFT is they actually made predictions which were confirmed by empirical science. <laughs> right. And and here's what's funny, like Ian, you know, he's a good sport, good guy. We we like his input. But in the chat, after I gave the cold slabs prediction, you know, he uh, he must have did a little research and said, well, the uniformitarians explain it like this. Well, of course, they're going to explain everything away. I mean, look how desperate Erica is right now to explain away the Y chromosome dissimilarity between humans and chimpanzees. And even CRISPR said, you know, we know humans and we know A and B are related. Therefore, even though A and C are more similar in this area, well, we know A and B are related. So overall, A and B are more similar. Like this is, th they don't even hear the words that are coming out of their mouth it's 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 laughable so here it is yeah they're gonna come up with the storyboard the rescue devices the point is they're asking for testable predictions creation scientists have made testable predictions that are future and novel they were found years later to come true that's a confirmed prediction we don't care if evolutionists decided to pull out their storyboard and resort to rescue device after rescue device that's not the point the prediction was made the prediction was confirmed that is the point Exactly, exactly. And what's funny is these people make fun of it and they don't understand it. They don't even study it. So it's kind of like saying, um, you know, oh, well, uh, I, I, the earth is hollow. Really? How do you know? I don't know. I don't know. I've never studied it. <laughs> it's, like the, it's like these former young earth creationists that you get on Dapper Dino's channel and – um, these former young earth creationists are, are like a boxer, not even a boxer. It's like somebody who took one class of boxing and they hated it. They weren't good at it. They got their butt kicked. So they never went again, but then they got interviewed years later and they, they told the interviewer that they were a former boxer because <laughs> they went to one boxing right. practice. These are the yeah. types of former creationists or former Christians or former young and Christians. Cause it's so funny. These same guys that are going on Dapper Dino's channel on this ridiculous show, they can't even reiterate to you some of the best lines of evidence for creation. They can't reiterate to you some of the best lines of evidence for young earth creation that has to do with testable predictions. Wayne Fillmore, supposed former, you know, young earth creationist. I debated him over a year ago. I talked about genetic entropy. He was like a deer in a headlight. How are you a former young earth creationist? And yet you've never heard of some of our best evidence, genetic entropy being one of them. Are you kidding me? Or the girl that was just on Paula Gia's channel that says she worked for AIG and they were so mean to her. And you listen to her. <laughs> Yeah, I was like, "What they make you do?" He was, she was like, "Well, I had to throw away the garbage. It was heavy." <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> what? what makes you not want to be a young Earth creation? What does this have to do with creation? Nothing. You're just a bad worker. Get over it. <laughs> Isn't it funny how lazy yeah. workers are always the ones that come out against like Ken Hovind at Dow or AIG? <laughs> they were lazy and they were offended that, you know, they, they got told to, to quit taking extended breaks. Oh, I'm going to contact Pelogia and expose AIG. Give me a break. <laughs> Why is it they love to voice their apostasy, though? I'm just so free now. I'm not a creationist. Think atheism, you know, in the name of atheism. Like, how stupid is that? I got to look at this comment. Look at Doki Doki. Best comments ever. I look forward to every morning waking up to see Doki Doki's comments. Look at this. Yeah. Doki Doki says, Pelogia titles his video. <laughs> <laughs> former AIG employee. What are they? Have thousands of employees? When she was just a janitor. Look, when she was just a janitor at the art museum. 
<laughs> yeah, where is the former like PhD scientist that worked for AIG that came out to expose them? Some lazy bad worker supposedly has a bone to pick against Ken Ham. Yeah, <laughs> like with mental with uh, mental problems. She, yeah, she wanted to kill herself all the time. She was suicidal. And so what does yeah. she do? She goes and posts on social media that she's no longer going to be a Christian. That was smart, huh? <laughs> and Pelogia jumped all over it, eh? Oh, you yeah. worked there for a month and you're a janitor? You're coming <laughs> on <to> my show. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, but back I've to literally, the I've literally seen workers make videos trying to expose uh, Dow by saying like, oh, you know, uh, Kent was mean because he made me go to daily meetings. That's called a job there, buddy. <laughs> I have daily meetings at my job. Am I so because my job has has meetings and requirements and work that I'm supposed to do? I'm just gonna quit and make a YouTube video complaining about them. No, you're just lazy. <laughs> oh, and unbelievable. Huh? Anyway, yeah. here, we, here we go. Not yeah, long. Yeah, go ahead. Predictions have been falsified, so it's the evolutionists that are moving the goalposts. It's a really plastic theory and i can give examples of evolution from the 50s saying well we know evolution has been going on for millions of years and so it's hopeless to find shared dna among species it's just been going on for too long mistakes have been happening too long that's a prediction expectation of evolution okay you say you can provide examples of that i would be interested to see those examples it hasn't made any new predictions and the only predictions that it has that have not been falsified are the ones that are unfalsifiable i'm taking <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh what are your thoughts on, on the and those comments unbelievable well he doesn't study so who cares what his opinion is he admitted yeah, he doesn't know. and then all of a sudden now he goes hey, we don't make any predictions what is it it's like uh, again it's like you said it's like stepping into the ring to fight because you told this guy you're gonna beat him up and then you're like um I've never trained a day in my life, but I know I can take them. Right. And they're like, who are you fighting? I don't know. You look across the ring and it's Mike Tyson, you know? <laughs> well, here's the thing. Um, it, it, it is true. If, if what we're looking at in the genomes of living organisms is the result of descent with modification. Okay. And we're look, what we're looking at is the result of uh, genomic fossils and evolutionary leftovers over millions and millions and millions of years, yeah, there would be a lot of junk. And that's why they need to hold to this idea of junk DNA because we know that mutation accumulation is a problem. And when it comes to the nuclear DNA mutation rate, 100 new mutations per person per generation are pouring into our genomes from generation to generation. If the majority of the genome is functional and those are hitting the functional regions, then they're all going to be deleterious. <laughs> and ape to man evolution, it will be impossible. You know, there's clearly shelf lives on genomes. So they need to say that the majority of the genome is junk. Those mutations hit the junk areas. They're absorbed by the junk areas, making them neutral. They don't do anything. Then they say that they build up over time and they're eventually utilized for evolutionary advancement. Nothing but a fairy tale based on what we know. They did not predict, like Dr. Jensen here is saying, this many conserved regions across all of biological life. Because that suggests that a lot of the genomes are functional because natural selection is maintaining these genomic regions and mutations are not just mutating them into oblivion. They, they were expecting a mess, you know, the, the sc scrambling going on in the genome. That's not what they actually found and and they've been shown to have egg on their face when it comes to dna function they were surprised by the encode results they've been surprised by the retro transposon functions they've been surprised by these non-coding areas of our genome that are proving to be in, incredibly functional they did not predict that the non-protein coding rnas okay dna to rna to protein Oftentimes, these evolutionists seem to think that the protein is your end result, when in fact, that is the case for only a small portion of the genome, when most of the genome is involved in these RNAs that are regulating virtually all aspects of the gene expression pathway. Now, they'll point to the fact that evolutionists predicted yeah, a little bit of function in these regulatory RNAs. A little bit, not nearly as much as has been found and not nearly as much as we are predicting future novel 
predicting. How do how do they exp- how does um, you know Vice Rhino explain the incredible functionality found in all of these non-protein coding RNAs? How does he explain the functions found in the ERVs, the retrotransposons, the pseudogenes? They say are genetic mistakes. When we know pseudogenes, a lot of them now appear to harbor the potential. Listen to this to regulate their protein coding cousins. Isn't that funny? Um, pseudogenes are a lot more functional in uh, healthy life processes in the uh, in the cell introns. You know, they're not just passive spacers. They're not just there for no reason. They're now known to be rich in splicing factor recognition sites. So, you know, my, my question too, this would go back to genome degradation, genetic entropy, mutation accumulation. What type of selection can vice rhino here? Uh, if he ever makes a response video, he's probably got a tear rolling down his face. But uh, what type of selection can he present us here with that can select away so many deleterious mutations that are pouring into our genetics and degenerating our information systems? Even if only 10% of the genome was functional, guess what? That still means 10 deleterious mutations are accumulating from generation to generation. Okay, that's still too much for ape to man evolution to be true. That still puts shelf lives on the genome. And yet we know that there's over 80% uh, evidence for biochemical activity. Now, we, we still have to do knockout tests. We're not testing all of these DNA elements, but um, there's the preliminary data suggests genome wide functionality. So I know I talked a lot there. I wanted to hammer that in. I want to see him address these points and not ignore them like our usual critics. What are your thoughts, guys? Go ahead, George. Oh, well, I, I find that uh, they, they never accept anything from a creationist source. Um, and they'll always point to the faith statement. And uh, I just talk, say back to them that, well, you've got your own faith statement, you know, when you've got people like, um, oh, I forget the guy's name, that says, do, do not allow a divine foot in the door. If Even if it looks like it's designed, um, proceed as if it's not designed. I mean, these are faith statements, their own faith statements. So I, I kind of get deterred by some, some of that because they, they figure that their own peer-reviewed journals are somehow more scientific than, say, the, um, the journals that we actually publish in. Yeah. No, that's true. That's well said. But let's move on because we still got four, five minutes to go. <laughs> oh, go, go. Okay. The ones. Sorry, what? Are unfalsifiable. I'm taking the challenge to them now and saying, "Hey, let's go out and there's a there's a fox in the woods. I bet you I can tell you how fast his mutation rate is." As it turns out, if we map these genes and their changes, we end up constructing a phylogeny with a nice little nested hierarchy that fits evolution perfectly. Now, I wanted to point out, you added that in, um, which is perfect. So I want to point out to the audience, yeah, we took the most important aspects of this video, Vice Rhino, to kind of condense it. You can watch the full video, but these are his main arguments. So what's funny is we've got Jensen there making a claim that he can take any species out in the wild. He can point and say, hey, here's a fox. I'll predict how fast that fox mutates, for example, you know, because they're all in line with biblical expectations in the mitochondrial DNA. And he's taking the challenge, like he said, to the evolutionist. But Vice Rhino doesn't know this. He picked a random video, did no research, barely knows who Jensen is. Now he's getting destroyed. Exactly. That's what, that was so funny. And like, this is what we say happened, right? That's our lineage. That's what we see. And they they expect that you just combine these bottom ones here with something else further back, and that's reality. When that's not what we see, never have, never will. And guess and guess why they won't take up that challenge? Because there, there's nothing worse than a non-creationist or anti-creationist confirming what a creationist has said. That would just be a, a destruction and a half. Yeah. Exactly. That's why the future testable predictions are on our side. They keep making retro predictions of the past, but that's easy. That's like that's like looking around and going, well, we see, uh, you know, a Frisbee over here. And therefore, somebody made a Frisbee. Yeah, no kidding. That's kind of like what they're doing. They're just they're extrapolating the evidence after they already find it. So their interpretation right. is on what they already look at. We're making the future. Yeah. So, 
Where should we look for the evidence? The retrofitting everything. I know we've been going at this for a while. I just want to, I just want to um, leave no stone unturned because we're going to make this impossible for him. Because what's funny, on those speciation rate predictions, even Ian was asking for predictions. We have the numbers here. Jensen is making prediction after prediction on the numbers of species that need to arise to account for what we see today in 4,500 years. He's made specific predictions on like bird species, for example. So if we're predicting two to three roughly bird species a year for 4,500 years, okay, and we're seeing new bird species today before our very own eyes. Praise, praise, you got some background noise there. Here's, let me mute praise. Praise. I'm losing my train of thought, man. What are you doing? So um, let's say two to three per year for 4,500 years, okay? Actually makes sense given the fact that we only have 10,000 bird species today. The question to Vice Rhino is, okay, if we're seeing new bird species today arising in the same genetic mechanisms that was predicted by creationists, why are there not 500,000 bird species? Okay, because if we're seeing new bird species today, we know rapid adaptation occurs quickly. Look at this paper right here. A new bird species has, has evolved on the Galapagos Island, for example. Um, study of Darwin finches reveals uh, that new species can arise quickly. Here's the thing. If birds evolved millions of years ago, maybe 100 million years ago from theropod-like dinosaurs, they're going to have to invoke what, Matt? Extinction event after extinction event after extinction event to account for why are there so few bird species today? They can't make predictions. They won't make predictions. Matt and I debated twice. I've debated him three times. A zoologist, herpetologist, Adam Heap. He couldn't make any predictions. He admitted it. Extinction rate is, is an issue. What do we see? Uh, just over 4,000 lizard species, under 4,000 snake species, bats, we got 1,200 species, rabbits, there's only 29 species. We got the genetic boundary study that reveals that species have clear genetic boundaries. The One of the authors says this, this conclusion is very surprising. I fought it as hard as I could. So leaving no stone unturned here, we got so many predictions on speciation rates, right in line with biblical expectations, way too few species to account for in deep time. There should be way more. Birds alone, there should be 500,000 species. So my question to Vice Rhino, don't tell me it's extinction rates. Give me a testable prediction. Give me a testable prediction on mitochondrial DNA, molecular clocks, no storyboard, no rescue devices, address the data. So that's it on that one. Yeah, the extinction rate is what it was is what's as a rescue device. Just, let's give them their two hundred thousand year old bottleneck. Now let's do something else in their favor and let's take every single bird species that's alive. Let's say they're related to one single bird. That's it. Two hundred thousand years ago. Let's reduce every species to one with the mutation or with the new speciation of three point three per year arising. That you, you just simply, even if half of them died from extinction from just 200,000 years ago, there's there's literally hundreds of thousands of bird species that should be here on Earth. If half died, half of them. See the problem? Evolution yeah. has no answer. Their, their, their rates are so far off from reality, it's embarrassing. And then for us, all it takes, since the, since the DNA differences are front-loaded, they're there from the beginning, all we need is recombination, gene conversion, and some mutations can add um, a little bit more diversity after the flood, after Babel. Those allele frequencies we see, the patterns are indication of a Babel event. There's traces of Babel in our genetics, but that's, you know, for another day. But that's the point. Everything to do with speciation is in line with us. If Vice Rhino uh, responded to this or debated us, it'd be nothing but retrodictions. It'd be nothing but storyboards, rescue devices, just like all the other critics we've been we've been destroying. No predictions coming from them, just complaints, nitpicking, and storyboards. Oh, yeah, and then you destroy them in a debate. Guess what? They don't change their mind. They go back to their channel and they tell their audience, oh, it's okay, they, they were just, you know, God did it, like Godless engineer, right? Had to, had to, straw man, had to just make things up, had no idea what you were saying, probably wasn't even listening, probably was thinking about his next meal. Um, <laughs> right.
just off in la la land and jump back on their channel doesn't even consider it right doesn't even consider a single point you brought up all he has is like well the consensus still believes it so therefore it must be true that's it that's what we're dealing with we already know we're not going to convert convert these guys their minds are already shot out from oh, that's what's so yeah that's what's so funny people like guts and given dr dan evo grad like these people think that we're just fighting to get them to change their minds no we understand that they are way too invested they're the militant critics that we are debunking, that we are debating, that we are showing know very little about creation versus evolution. Their arguments are easily addressed. They dodge our arguments. They dodge the evidence. And that's what we're here. We're here to increase the faith of our um, brothers and sisters in Christ. We're here to help convert those that are on the fence, those that are open-minded. But no, you're militant. You're militant evolutionists. Are you kidding me? Yeah, they're way too. And that's why, especially with Dan, you know, you give him the answers. It's in one ear and out the other. You think someone like Dan who has been studying for 100 years, invested all this money in, in evolutionary biology. You think he's going to tap out? <laughs> you know, he's going to go to his boss and say, I just realized that everything I believe is a lie. Like, give me a break. We're not trying to convince you guys. It'd be nice. You know, it's possible. You know, anybody can come to repentance. But I mean, a lot of them are just militant, hardened you know, it's for the observer. It's for the viewer. Exactly. And you, and you hit the nail on the head. You said repentance. That's what they won't want to care about. They're, they want to live their life there. That's why you yeah. call them change control Dan. He comes in and he's like, oh, I got this. <laughs> I got to fix this. Yeah. Damage, con yeah. Damage control Dan, Dan, the pseudoscience, man. Yeah, there is. Because a lot of the times it's not the evidence. A lot of the times... It, it's, it's something deeper than that when it comes to these people, you know. They've seen the evidence. That's why the Bible says that they're, they're oftentimes willingly ignorant. Well, as I always say, ignorance is bliss, but it's not a virtue, so. Okay. I'll, 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 share, I'll, share, um, I'll share an experience I had with, uh, I, was a breed, I was a bird breeder for about 10 years in my younger years. I bred canaries and uh, zebra finches. I started off with variegated canaries. Uh, for those that don't know what that is, it's uh, uh, literally a uh, um, yellow, black, green feathered canary. And then within the 10 years, I actually bred pure yellow and pure white canaries. I did the same thing with the zebra finches. I started off with the natural color of the zebra finches, gray. I ended up with fawn uh, zebra finches as well as white zebra finches within 10 years. So uh, that's my personal experience to show you that um, birds can speciate. Right. That's a great point, George. Birds can speciate before our very own eyes, but yet only, yeah. what, 10 to 12,000? today perfectly in line with young earth creation expectations where's the hundreds of thousands of bird species you know it's so funny because i've asked that question so many times and i i matt and i know exactly what answer is coming well you got to account for extinction rates okay and then we say okay account for them how many extinction events do you have to account for to explain such little species today they can't make predictions which means their answer is pseudoscience exactly. according to their own standards they set the standards Science, the gold standard of science is to make testable and falsifiable predictions. Yet we're the ones that are doing it, and they're the ones that are resorting to the storyboard. Hilarious. All right, let's finish it up. <laughs> by geology, by all sorts of other fields of science, anatomy, embryology, everything but genetics. How can you possibly say that? Genetics is one of the best lines of evidence for evolution. Since the 1960s, scientists have been using protein sequence analysis as an indirect method of genetic sequencing and have used these sequences to compare proteins among species and have found that phylogenetic trees constructed with such methods match pretty much perfectly with the trees constructed using paleontological and anatomical data. So we've been using molecular genetics as evidence for evolution for as long as molecular genetics have been around, and we used Mendelian genetics as evidence for evolution before that. Every 
every time the question comes up as to what someone thinks is the best evidence for evolution, the answer is almost invariably something to do with genetics, whether that be phylogeny is constructed with molecular genetics, the tracing of morphological traits to specific genetic mutations, the study of epigenetic factors and their role in evolution, the tracing of endogenous retroviruses, or one of the many, many other areas encompassed by the study of genetics. Genetics are at the forefront of evolutionary studies. We have clocks in our DNA, but anyway, when he, of course, evolution today is about biology, but when Darwin came out, when he started it, there was no such thing. They had to uh, improve on that later. So yeah, that's what Dr. Jensen saying. He just kind of straw man them, you know what I mean? Obviously, Jensen being a geneticist and a biologist and working on stem cells in the laboratory for cancer himself with multiple published studies on the subject, he knows exactly <laughs> about the various field he's making predictions on and writing books on. So he was talking about how it shifted, how it originally it was paleontology and geology and the fossil record, things like that. That's what the main evidence was. Now it's shifted. Well, Back. you know, that, that's a good, well, that's a good point you brought up, Matt, because he's done a lot of misrepresenting here. I don't, he's probably, I don't know if he's doing it on purpose. He's just not up to date. But um, here's the thing. You're right. It has shifted. And the genetics, you know, that's what's inherited sperm and egg, gene traits and genetics. That's what the Jensen said. That's where the war is won between creation and evolution. And that's where the predictions need to be made. And that's why, as we've proven here, and Matt, you've done a great job on all the specific details on the studies, molecular clocks is proving to be the death blow to the evolutionary story. DNA function is proving to be the death blow. He, he brought up ERVs. We talked about that earlier in great detail. We've got video upon video. We made a video with Ken Hoven on his channel that's got, what, 15,000 views on ERVs destroying Vice Rhino, Pelogia, Conspiracy Cats. We've had no response yet. So my, my question is, we, all, we always show a number of papers showing these functions from the secularists themselves. Um, we can see that these ERVs, other classes of retrotransposons too, you know, this is directed right at Vice Rhino. You brought up ERVs. We know that they accomplish many crucial functions in regulating gene expression. They help with cell stress responses, development, they're determining cell types. They're critical, you know, show us how this is possible. Show us a, a, a paper, show us empirical evidence of a non-functional endogenous retrovirus going from non-functional to incredibly functional in our genome. I debated conspiracy cats on this for almost two hours. I'll happily debate Vice Rhino on it since he believes that um, it's the number one best evidence for evolution, even though it's evidence for our model of created heterozygosity. So how does he explain the functional orphan genes? How does he explain the uh, dissimilarity between chimp and human Y chromosome? How does he explain the molecular clocks? How does he explain the DNA function? How does he explain the low genetic diversity? How does he explain the out of Africa scenario, which would have reduced the population at that time to about two to 10,000 for many generations would have been incredibly genetically compromising. All of these deleterious mutations that have been accumulated, now they're going to rapid fixation leading to accelerated genetic degeneration. And we're supposed to believe that this hypothetical population suddenly exploded in all parts of the world, seizing dominion over the planet. Vice Rhino, tell us how that's even remotely feasible. We don't want storyboards, we want direct answers. Every line of evidence you just provided is not evidence for fish to fisherman evolution. It's evidence for our model. And even if we got into the chromosome two fusion, that's a failed prediction. We know that the chromosome two fusion is now uh, that purported site is overlapped by a functional gene. The area is far too degenerate. There's a satellite DNA problem. I mean, we could go on and on and on. And Vice Rhino has a, a specific video on ERVs. So uh, <laughs> if you thought we talked about it a lot here, wait till we get to that video. Unless anyone else has anything to add there. Because what I like is Vice Rhino there, he just named off a bunch. They'll do that, right? They'll try and overwhelm you. They'll just name five different lines of evidence. What I do, especially in debates, once they name one, I'll say, don't slap and run. Let's discuss that one. And then you'll see that it's not evidence for evolution. Then you go on to the next one. And you can, you can independently dismantle every single line of evidence that they bring up. And every single line of evidence he just brought up that he just tried to slap and run past us 
not evidence for pawns come to people evolution. So never let them get by with anything. A good one. Exactly. Yours. That easily fit two people. It's kind of telling that he had to think about that for a second before adding on the two people line, because mitochondrial Eve might wind up looking kind of like she existed 6,000 years ago if you use mitochondrial DNA mutation rates from two outdated studies from the 90s. But to the best of my knowledge, Y chromosome Adam has never been placed anywhere near 6,000 years ago. Go ahead, you're up. <laughs> You want me to? You want me to take this one? <laughs> I just went <laughs> at it hardcore. Um, so with well, it's just funny because with the mitochondrial DNA, the Y chromosome, both incredibly low variation. We've got a confirmed testable prediction that there's only about 4,500 years worth of mutation accumulation in the Y chromosome. Testable predictions on the history of civilization detected in the Y chromosome. The fact is we can build a family tree based on Y chromosomes, based on mitochondrial DNA, takes us back to two single ancestors, Adam and Eve, exactly what we'd expect according to the biblical based model. Apparently the chimpanzee, which is our closest common ancestor is less than 70% similar to the human Y chromosome. How does Vice Rhino exp explain this without invoking storyboards? When it comes to the Y chromosome and how little variation it has, okay, the Y chromosome, the number of mutations take us back to 4,500 years, exactly what's expected. Vice Rhino doesn't even understand the biblical base model. It would be Y chromosome Noah. While the mitochondria leave for technical reasons but you can get into later, we can uh, take back to 65 hundred years. Now here's, here's my question. If vice Rhino has a problem with this because of the fact that every single male Y chromosome on the planet today is nearly identical. Okay. There is, there's ex extraordinarily little variation in the Y chromosome. That is strong indication in and of itself that we share a very recent Y chromosomal ancestor combined with how dissimilar the chimpanzee Y chromosome is. The, the orphan genes, molecular clocks, whatever. This puts humans in their own separate created kind. Where can Vice Rhino show us evidence today on this earth for any highly divergent or highly mutated Y chromosomes? He won't be able to present that data to us because everything we see in the Y chromosome is reflective of a young genome um, if the, if the Y chromosome is mutating fast and it does wild things, they, they have to purport this to even explain why the Y chromosome in chimps and humans is so dissimilar. If it's doing so many wild things, okay, and it's not recombining DNA for the most part, then the fact that there's so little mutations speaks of the youth the youthfulness of the Y chromosome of the genome as a whole. If you want to, if you want to talk about evidence in our genome that directly speaks of the youthfulness of the genome, how does vice Rhino explain the existence of these large linkage blocks? Because as we know, genetic mechanisms like recombination and gene conversion, if we've been evolving for millions and millions of years, we've gone from the Australopithecines to Homo erectus, to modern homo sapiens, for example, that means there's been a lot of recombination and gene conversion and crossing over going on. Our linkage blocks in our genomes should be scrambled to nothing, nothingness. But the fact is, and Dr. Carter speaks of this when he looks at the HapMap data, we still have so many large linkage blocks that obviously they've not been scrambled to nothingness. There hasn't been enough time, which speaks once again of a young genome, speaks of Adam and Eve. Recombinational hotspots is nothing but circular reasoning, just like de novo gene synthesis is circular reasoning when it comes to orphan genes. We don't want a storyboard. We don't want rescue devices, Vice Rhino. Give us predictions. Give us uh, something that's empirical. You know, no more storyboards. The evidence in genetics just speaks of biblical creation. So I, I think that'll do it <laughs> for him, unless you want anything to add. I mean, he's going to have to deal with the, the new study that suggests the Y chromosome mutates a lot faster than we ever could have expected. He wants, as always, the critics, they're going to complain, 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 but they're not going to deal with the second paper that shows, as you can see here, testable predictions that have flowed from the um, 
Y chromosome molecular clock data. So he's right. They wouldn't have lived at the same time because we're, we're looking at Y chromosome Noah. We're looking at mitochondrial Eve. Yeah. And that's also a part of the problem as well is that evolutionists don't like to share their data, right? They came out with this study right here, the Cameron study, and they hid the data when it, when it came back as 4,500 years. So they added filters. So when you Google how old was Y chromosome Adam, you get these large dates. So of course he wasn't able to find any evidence for young earth creation because you won't find the evidence. They hide it in studies and the multiple two regions uh, studies that came out looking at high um, uh, rates right here, the very first one, when they actually looked at the high coverage branches, they actually determined that it was just a few thousand years old. But that's because the Y chromosome is so big. What is it, 56 million base pairs? So they didn't have that available information a long time ago. So they've always been giving large dates because that's what they need for their model. But it's not reality. So good luck trying to debunk that vice rhino. Well, guess what? Once again, just like the mitochondrial DNA, there's only a few different a few differences separating any two people in the Y chromosome. I think there's maybe 300 average. That's not a lot, especially considering the Y chromosome mutates fast. Once again, that's not a lot to explain. You know, the evolutionists have to do a lot of calibrating. They got to fudge the numbers to get their dates. They ain't going to do it. Plus they got no prediction. So just wanted to add that point. Good point. Good. All right, here we go. Had Y chromosome Adam likely lived between 120,000 and 156,000 years ago? The astute among you may have noticed that neither of those date ranges include 6,000 years as an estimate. There are, of course, other estimates that use different methods of calculation based on the molecular clocks and came to different ranges, but I am unaware of any that came to the conclusion that Y chromosome Adam was only 6,000 years ago. We touched on this. Which we just destroyed. And, oh, he's not aware. So he just did a video on somebody who put out two papers on the Y chromosome in December, which was how many months ago? Um, but he's not aware. You know, shows how little research he does. Ridiculous. Yeah, that's, what, that's what I was talking about doing their homework. They don't do their homework. No, they would fail my class. <laughs> Uh, you guys notice a, a central theme when you sit when you search for a humanity and how far back the, in, in in time humanity actually goes in recorded history. You notice you notice something. <laughs> See the Greek. <laughs> That's amazing. Why is that? They can question that. They should really ponder why humanity only goes back worldwide to the same dates. Just, just ponder that, you know, and why are they consistent with these Y chromosome mutation rates in our, you know, just exactly, exactly. The only well, times that they can get bigger dates that go back past biblical history is through indirect means, indirect methods, assumptions based on the deep, deep time evolutionary geological column. No, the direct data, the empirical data always confirms the biblical creation model and they can't deal with it. It's a blow, it's a detrimental blow to their theory. And well, the other thing is, is ninety nine point nine percent of the time, when you do a search, the very first thing that pops up is Wikipedia. Yeah, I can guarantee you, ninety nine point nine percent of the times, so it'll be Wikipedia. Exactly. Well, remember, uh, remember Ron. <laughs> we love him. He's always on here for debates. But you know, he's in a debate on ev evidence for evolution, and you're like, oh, well, what's what's the best evidence? I don't know. Go look at Wikipedia. <laughs> uh, I love how th these evolutionists all always say there's so much evidence, so much, and then you ask them for one, and they say, well, there's just so much, I can't think of one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If if you if you recall, I've I've asked him uh, twice now in two separate debates about the caterpillar to butterfly. And in my uh, uh, most recent question, I said to him, I know Wikipedia explains the metamorphosis process, but it doesn't explain the evolution of the metamorphosis process. And he came back again. He goes, oh, it's in Wikipedia. It's not in Wikipedia. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's so funny. I remember that. Sometimes it's hard to hold back the laughs uh, when I'm moderating those ones, George. <laughs> Thank yeah. God for the mute button. 
Well, here's another thing. They're always talking about how multiple fields of science like converge and they all prove each other. Really, well, why does the dendrochronology point to the sci same time frame as this Y chromosome atom, which is genetic? And why do genealogies go back and trace to the same time? How come linguistics pops up them? Or the history of civilizations like I just showed with all that? Or how about math and farming and agriculture? You can go down the line. They all converge recently, not even close to their supposed bottleneck. So what does that mean? Well, think about 200,000 years. Okay. And then what? 195,000 of them, humans worldwide couldn't figure out to do any of those things, but it all happened worldwide for at the same time from civilizations that never met each other. What does that make any logical sense at all to anybody? It can't because it's stupid. As evidence, and to me theologically this makes more sense, God creates Adam and Eve with differences from the start, with the appearance of parents. That's not deceptive because God can create any which way he wants to. So the best evidence for creation, in your opinion, is that God designed Adam and Eve with the appearance of already having mixed genetics from having genetic parents, thereby making it look like they weren't specially created. First, should we look for the evidence for Adam and Eve? The creation evolution debate has been dominated by fossils, by geology, by all sorts of other fields. Uh, even though I'm tired, I just can't let him slap and run. So he, he learned absolutely nothing trying to ref refute this video. The created heterozygosity, okay, for example, um, how God would have front-loaded Adam and Eve, the created kinds, with these pre-existing DNA differences. Here's the thing. We, are, we touched on it earlier. Even Dr. Joshua Swamidas admits that it would be ridiculous to assume that God would have created the first couple, the original kinds, genetically homogeneous or like an empty vessel with no genetic information. But it doesn't even matter if he says it's post hoc ad hoc because guess what? It leads to, and we've been discussing it for three hours, testable predictions on mutation rates, speciation rates, DNA function. Is he going to address any of that? I predict, here's a testable prediction, I predict he won't. And also, that's recombining DNA. That's biparentally inherited DNA, the nuclear DNA. When we look to the, uh, the mitochondrial DNA in the Y chromosome, that is non-recombining DNA. That is uniparentally inherited DNA. So we say that those DNA differences are the result of mutation. And guess what? So do the evolutionists. That's why we're doing a head-to-head -head prediction on the uniparentally inherited DNA. And guess what? They only go back, lo and behold, maximum 6,000 years. So there you go. He's not going to deal with it, though. So he misunderstands the entire created heterozygosity hypothesis and does exactly what Godless Engineer does. And it obviously went in one ear and out the other, doesn't address anything, and then just says, oh, God did it. You see how unsophisticated these guys' arguments are? So unsophisticated, unintelligent. They don't engage the data. It's sad. This has actually been too easy, <laughs> hasn't it? One of the one of the things that um, evolutionists remind me of. I'm not sure if everyone, anyone in there has uh, read a book called uh, "Rules for Radicals" by Al Selinsky or something like that. I can't remember his his exact uh, name. But one of the one of the things that he says is always accuse the other side what you are doing. So when the evolutionists accuse us of doing pseudoscience, it's because it's them that are doing the pseudoscience. I know. Well, again, remember, people are sheep. They follow what they follow because they don't want to be considered on the fringe. Most people love to fit in. The second you become outside of that, you're a conspiracy theorist. You're a... Yeah. You know what I mean? You're uh, you're an outlier. You know, it's like, oh, that guy's just a rebel. That's why he doesn't agree. People love the consensus. Why do you think the Catholic Church is the first to jump on the the bandwagon for anything that the masses like? Because they love the numbers. It's obvious. They they you know one one thing pops up and boom, they'll jump right on it. They're like master politicians, you know. But here we go. Last last segment right here. Where should we look for the evidence for Adam and Eve? The creation evolution debate has been dominated by fossils, by geology, by all sorts of other fields of science, anatomy, embryology, everything but genetics. How can you possibly... Oh, I guess I had that in there twice, everybody. Sorry about that. Let me see. That. Yep. 
that was it. Actually, I had two. I had parts in there twice. I didn't know if I had it the first time. So that that spies Rhino now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, he's been terminated. <laughs> oh man! Wait, is it? See, here's the problem with the evolutionist. He made a 17 minute video. Okay. And then we took out the important parts, made it about 13, 14 minutes. But because they say more things wrong in one sentence than there are words in that sentence, it takes us three hours to dismantle so many errors. <laughs> and but, but that's what he looks like now. So he's, uh, yeah, definitely share this video, guys, because force him to respond or force him to debate. Yep. He won't do either. So just remind his audience that he's just pushing more pseudoscience without being able to defend it because it's just the nonsense that he wants to peddle to the people. And he doesn't even understand what he's arguing against. How does that make any sense to anybody? Exactly. He's arguing against a straw man. Oh, I'm sorry, George. Actually, go ahead, George. No, I was going to say, um, before we finish off, can I just digress a little bit? I'll give you some information to those people in the chat as well. Yeah, I, was no conversing, I was conversing with Brian Nickel. You, you know Brian Nickel, uh, the uh, HPT guy? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we love yeah. him. Yeah, I was. I actually invited him to uh, to be interviewed on on the channel, but uh, he's busy. But what he told me was, they're currently revising the ninth edition of the hydroplate uh, plate theory, Walt Brown's HPT, and he's telling me that what what he's doing now, he's heavily involved into calculations to address a lot of the issues around the heat problem. So the new the new book, when it does come out, it will actually have calculations to show and to put put to bed this uh, objection about the heat problem. So that's awesome. that's just passing on some information to everyone uh, based on what Brian had actually told me. I love it. I love it. Well, what's funny is we've given guts at Gibbon and these other critics, you know, ten maybe more great solutions to the so-called heat problem. But remember, they're not looking for an answer. And now we're going to have the exact numbers. We're going to have the math from Brian Nichols. They'll get the yep. math and it still won't be good enough. Because remember, they're, they're too militant. They're too invested. They're not actually looking for honest discourse on these issues. So that's amazing news, George. I love it, brother. Well, the Bible did predict that in, in the end, people would be willingly ignorant of a few things. And one of them was the flood. It, and the flood explains so many things. You know, and that was one thing that was fascinating to me and something so basic where when I first got into this and I denied a global flood before, I looked at it as kind of silly. And then when I started seeing the evidence, I was overwhelmed by it. And I seen Second Peter that predicted thousands of years ago that there would be people in the last days who denied three things. The creation, we know that, which was a special creation. They're trying to explain everything naturalistically. Uh, the flood and the coming judgment. The three I things mean, people mean. deny and the flood being one of the main things that uh, explains all the geology, the earth, the um, phenomena around us. And yet that's what people are debating and that's what people are denying. So it's a fascinating, fulfilled prophecy. So I guess that looks like, oh, go ahead, George. Take, go uh, ahead, no, George. I was just going to say th thank you for inviting me. And um, I'll say hello to Praise because he hasn't said much for about the last hour and a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Praise, you still here? Oh, yeah. I think Praise has probably had breakfast, lunch, and dinner all, all throughout this. Uh, uh, <laughs> Praise, you there? Yeah. No, you know, I'm not um, here. <laughs> 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 Any final thoughts, Praise? What do you think about his philosophy, presuppositions? Assumptions. What do you What do you think, brother? Any final thoughts? Total beatdown, and uh, you guys totally beat him down. His stupid arguments yeah. that have been regurgitated <laughs> over and over and over. <laughs> I love I love your final assessment. <laughs> so what do you think, Brace? Stupid argument. Stupid argument. <laughs> like, well, you're not wrong, Brace. <laughs> oh yeah, no, this was an absolute beatdown, destruction, Matt. I love. Uh, 
I love that. <laughs> that bloody rhino you showed at the end there. So uh, anyone else? Uh, final. Actually, you know, I'm going to show this one on screen. There we go. There's yeah. Vice Rhino right there. No, no, that's Vice gonna, Rhino of audience. <laughs> I, I was, I was going to say we, we need to do more of these where we pick a video and completely destroy it. Amen. Well, and that's what we're doing now. So we're going to, I titled it another one, but another evolutionist bites the dust series. And you know, it, it, this is what we're going to do. I mean, we looked at this video, um, didn't even have to do any prep work. We just saw it today and we, we watched a few minutes of it and we said, here we go. This is going to be an easy one. So, and like I said, to the audience, George praise Matt and anybody sees a video they want to us to refute, like we did tonight, send it our way and we'll do it. Cause there is so much content out there that we can do this forever. I've already got a saved playlist of uh, list of Vice Rhino videos we're going to destroy, but he, he can't come back from this one, so I don't know. There's 24 people here at 4 in the morning, Lara. It's incredible. <laughs> it's 5 in the morning. <laughs> hey, that's what I like about our audience. You know, they're, they're, they're rock stars. They're party animals. Even at 5 a.m., they're in here supporting us, giving us super chats. Super stickers. That's, so yeah, uh, that's what awesome I call commitment. That's what I call commitment. Yes, that, that's commit. That's commitment. We're changing. We're changing things, guys. So um, yeah, I guess I guess we'll end it there. Unless Matt, any good. final words before we shut her down? <laughs> no, man. All good. We 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 answered everything. So there's no way he's going to say, Oh, well, they weren't clear. <laughs> <laughs> you can't say that. We really did uh, answer everything above and beyond. Didn't we? Well, you know, if he didn't understand the creation model, he sure does now. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, maybe we should end it there. That was good. You've been waiting the whole time to say that. Haven't you, Matt? No, nah, it just came to me. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I don't know. With these guys, one, in one ear and out the other, right? How many times have we explained the model to the same person? <laughs> my my yeah. favorite is when you explain it to the person three times and then you debate them and you say, can you repeat my model? And it's just silence. <laughs> <laughs> Are you referring to our good friend, David Neff? <laughs> a waste of life. Huh? <laughs> uh, yeah, he's fun. He's a he's, he's great guy, good sport. But people like David Neff, David Baldock, you know, what they're good for is – a nice two hour creation lecture. <laughs> oh, we love them. I got to give them credit. They're at least willing to come on and debate, unlike 99.9% .9 of other evolutionists. I'll, I'll finish it off on um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night to everyone. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Truman Show. Good afternoon, good evening, and good night. All right. See you later, guys. See you later. Have a, God have a good day.